Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. UFOs, and we're in for a treat tonight. But before we bring in these fine, good-looking specimens of scientific engineering, let us say hello to everyone in our chat rooms tonight. We got Race Fan in the gold medal position. Acreon takes over the silver with our good friend Jack Clark. A nice bronze medal for him. The gorgeous Cosmic Floor, how are you? Smithy, thank you so much for kicking off the Super Chat tonight. The Super Chat is a wonderful way to support what we do on Spaced Out Radio on a nightly basis, so thank you so much. Hello, Nightmare, JoJo Bone, Grand Paul Holland, good to have you all here. Logan L., Simon, Jeffrey DeRuin, how you doing, guys? And uh, by the way, Jeffrey will be signing autographs after the show. Line up to the left of the studio, if you don't mind, to the left of the studio. Tom, what's up? Mama Susan, Kevin, good to have you all here. The lovely Candy Romero from Vegas. She will be at our Vegas party April 22nd to 24th, and we are looking forward to it. We're going zip lining, zip lining. That's what we're doing. Joshua S., John Swan, stunning Samantha Hazelwood Gray. Nice to have you all here as we continue with our roll call tonight. Who do we go to next? Oh, there's Major Lee. How you doing? Stunning Tina Smith, Luscious Jewels, uh, the lovely and talented Michelle N. Just a friend crafts. It is a mouthful, but it is worth every consonant and vowel. Vowel. Awesome Arlene. Lovely Linda is here. Lovely Linda will be signing autographs after the show as well. Line up to the right of the studio, to the right of the studio. Thank you, Linda, for that wonderful super chat. Very much appreciate your love and support of Spaced Out Radio. Uncle Dale and his power stash are here. Uncle Dale just had a birthday. So did his power stash. Happy belated birthday, Uncle Dale. Thank you so much for being a good fan of what we do here. Awesome. And Celine, there is the gorgeous Thin Lizzie Borden, the lovely Kathy Evans. How are you, ladies? Good to see you. All right, let us continue here with our roll call. Who do we got next? Oh, we got Cloudy with a chance of UFOs. Been a while. Good to have you back. Richard Elmore is here. And who else? We got Jurassic Joey, the Jurassic Joey. Yes. Okay, moving on here as we have Noble Patrick. There's Mennonite Abe. Uh, Ian McFadden, how are you, buddy? And who else has joined us? Um, let's see here. Logan L. Downshift. And uh, hold on here. Let me just see here. Oh, there's our man, Belenium, Project Blue Book. Listen, my eyes went blurry there for a second because I have like these progressives and sometimes they screw up my eyes. Hold on. We got to start this one here. Because we need kind of the radio side to be going too. All right, the gorgeous Pinzer Flactum, fifty nine hundred buck double Tim. What's going on? The gorgeous and talented Kira. How are you? Nice to have you all here. And who else is here? Oh, let's see here. The lovely Avi M has returned. Sweet Murray F has returned. And who else has returned? It's Enzo. Michael Gutierrez. Good to see you. Lovely Donna Spencer, thanks for coming on in. Papa Willie, the bodyguard, good to have you here. Dog next door, welcome back. And uh, Science Bob is in the room. Glenn John McEnroe, 
the pride of Wimbledon, Digger Dog, Rano Err, the Michael Leger, everyone, the Michael Leger. Hey, gorgeous Dirt Road, how you doing? Phil Minervino, nice to see you here. And who else? Can we get him on in? Oh, Doug Shelby's here. The Doug Shelby. Yep. Smoke him if you got him, he always says. There's Science Bob. Thank you, Science Bob, for a wonderful super chat. Oh, we always love you around here, Bob. You know that. All right. Who else is here? We're running out of time. Nicola, welcome back, and thank you for the super chat as well. Lovely Jessica McCreary, always a pleasure to have you here. We're running out of time. Can we do it? Gorgeous Pam McSee, Gong Show, Boss Monster. How are you all doing? And we're done. Horns up. Let's rock. From the mountains of central British Columbia to you listening around the world, this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Go to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. You can follow us on Twitter at spaced out radio, Instagram at spaced out radio show, and now on TikTok at spaced out radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you rock out and bumblefoot read shirky poos newswire check out our swag as well tonight's show is brought to you by chive charities help make the world 10 percent happier by visiting chive charities today you can find them on our website a fantastic science bob and friends for you tonight as bob mcguire will be here geeking out on uap technology with brandon safford of the scu Hour three sees us head into the swamp with another great story from Swamp Dweller. Fedora John brings in the UFO report. Shirky Poo has got the news. and We'll try and squeeze in the thought of the Dave. Yes, it's that time of the month once again where we bring in our resident spaced out radio scientist, Dr. Bob McGuire, to discuss the scientific side of the supernatural, paranormal, and ufological. Each month, Science Bob brings in a special guest with a scientific or research background to talk about all the practical and scientific sides to the high strangeness that surrounds us. Joining us tonight from the SCU is Brandon Safford. He is a civilian scientist, fourth generation mad scientist, and the coordinator of the Night Watch Institute, of which he is the only public-facing member and owner. He opened it in December of 2021 after about two to three months of research following the release of the Pentagon report on UAP. At that point, he had been working as a business broker and a data scientist before that, and as well as an IT contractor. This man's been there, done it all, but we're going to have a good time tonight. Science Bob, Brandon Safford, Welcome to Spaced Out Radio, gentlemen. Science Bob, good to have you back. Where the heck are you in this world wearing those fantastic overalls tonight? I am in Ocala, Florida. Uh, tomorrow we're in Orlando because I am attending a conference and giving multiple talks. Very nice. What kind of conference are you speaking at? It's an amateur radio conference, and this is the national conference for the American Radio Relay League this year. Oh, very nice. Very nice. Good to have and, you. Hey, I'm, in Florida, I'm in Florida, dude, while other people are having winter. Like who? Is that a shot at us Canadians? Is it that is. what that is? Yes. Mm. Boy, great be real, it, would be, it would be really, really hard <laughs> to, you know, not take that personally. I'm, I'm just saying. It'll but, only be you know. 70 Fahrenheit tomorrow. Hmm. Hmm. Must be nice. Well, let's do the old weather test here. Uh, what's the temperature at SORHQ? Well, right now we are a a balmy four degrees Celsius, thirty nine Fahrenheit. Nice. Balmy. That's balmy. Better. Yeah, and the warm temperatures. You know what? It's weird because normally at this time of year we're at minus thirty eight Celsius, minus forty Celsius. 
and we hit our, our real cold spurt back in December and early January. So we may not get it. Might actually have an early spring this year. Screw the groundhog. British Columbia is warming up. Thank goodness. That means more Bigfoot hunting. More Bigfoot hunting. <clears throat> Yes. So Anybody we, that's on Facebook, go to my page for Science Bob Facebook page, and you can see the wolf I unleashed on Phil. <laughs> Don't blame you. Brandon Safford, let's learn a little bit about you, my friend. And I want to say thank you so much for coming on Spaced Out Radio. You're a new member of the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies, otherwise known as the SCU. I mean, what's it like being a part of that group where here you are, here we have scientists, whether it's you know Avi Loeb, whether it's Gary Nolan, or or many other giant names in the UFO community. I mean, I mean that's a UFO geeks dream that team right there, man. And and I'm saying that as I'm jealous and I'm not a part of it like you two are. It's humbling uh, to to say the least, um, especially you know for someone like me, I'm entire almost entirely self taught. I have an associates of science from the local junior college, and um, you know I've earned some uh, certifications like. Six Sigma black belt, but I'm not on Avi Dr. Loeb's level uh, at all, you know, much less, uh, you know, most of the, the people out there in terms of uh, academic credentials. Um, it's just I never stopped loving science. And I, every spare minute that I wasn't trying to earn a buck, I was learning about science. If I was mowing the yard, if I was doing dishes, I would be in listening to a podcast or, you know, reading and uh, listening to an audio book about it. And so uh, when suddenly the Pentagon's announcement on UAP came to my attention that uh, this was an entirely verboten branch of physics and science that we just weren't allowed to t even look at previously. And now all of a sudden we had permission to look at it. The best way I could use to describe it is uh, imagine if you're a really, really Catholic family, right? Like several generations Catholic that, uh, you know, the, what the Vatican says is more or less how your family is going to run. All right. Well, that's kind of how my family's been with uh, the Pentagon or any sort of government service in general. It's, you know, what they they have paid for generations of my family to be able to eat and and uh, put a roof over their head. So if they say, don't study this, don't talk about this, don't look at this. We didn't. We just didn't. You know, it didn't it didn't enter our head to question it. Um, the assumption was you know, always that someone else was taking care of it. So when uh, suddenly uh, we see, uh, you know, hey, there's a, suddenly the UFO phenomenon. Uh, yeah, actually, it's real. Uh, yeah, actually, we, we just kind of, uh, we had to tell you it was fake for a while because we didn't want to worry about airspace. Uh, but now we really could use civilian help in getting it and stuff. And I thought, wow, this is really Really, and, and, you know, and I didn't even believe it at first. I just kept, I kept looking into it. I kept looking into it, and it, uh, and and finally, I was like, you know what? All right, I guess it's real. It's getting okay. Fine, I'll look into it. And so I dropped the business world. Uh, I went full time into science, uh, and then just started funding the institute on my own uh, through teaching classes uh, at the. Uh, public education level until such time as uh, uh, until such time as research funding or uh, grants or otherwise come through. Science Bob. Oh, that's great. Well, Brent, tell us where you're from and what got you to the place where you were so interested when that announcement was made. You and I'm going to tell you how similar our stories are in a minute. How you made this jump. What was your past? Where did you grow up? And how, how do you door a SCU? Sure. Yeah. Um, so uh, growing up, actually, uh, I kind of split my time between my parents' house and my grandparents' house. Uh, my, uh, my granddad 
Uh, he was uh, basically civilian scientist also, uh, but, you know, GS uh, wor working levels. Uh, and he had anywhere there was a neat event that happened, he worked there. Uh, Operation Paperclip, he got to fire off some of the last of the V-2 missiles, stuff like that. When he wasn't working in labs like Los Alamos or, uh, you know, Groom or places like that, he was in his garage designing and developing stuff. So I, or he was up in his workshop writing at the, actually the very desk that I'm sitting at right now, uh, I, I inherited from him. Uh, designing stuff, just anything. He never stopped designing and building stuff. So I grew up in a workshop of a guy who developed everything from missiles to robotics to lasers to fiber optics to um, drones before they even called them remote control planes. Uh, a lot of his stuff was still classified. When he died, 30 generals showed up to his, his funeral I mean, that was the kind of crazy, mad genius that I, you know, grew up around. And then my dad, you know, my dad uh, went into the software and, you know, he, he went to Rice. He developed the uh, the first uh, bill, the, the back when the machines were on tapes and they had the big old tape reels, they had two main standard sizes and the two sizes couldn't talk to each other. So dad got irritated by that because it was, it, he needed research to, and, and tests and programs to try and transfer from one to the other. So he just developed the hardware and software to get them to talk to each other, you know, and that was his start to it. And then he developed a CAD system that was kind of the main competitor to AutoCAD. And he'd take me with him into the office sometimes. And he'd have uh, like the networks back then, you know, well, back in the old days, the networks, no, but we had these giant dip switches that were like, you know, a foot or two big boxes and these little bitty tiny switches in it that you had to set with like the head of a, a needle or a pen or something. Or if you were a kid and had teeny tiny fingers and you could fit under the um, elevated air conditioned floorboards, uh, he'd just give me a flashlight and a diagram and a, you know, a letter and number and say, go match the buttons to that. And I could go under that or I could remove paper jams from the uh, punch card uh, reading machines. Later on, I'd be working when uh, when he finally got a hold of uh, uh, actual personal computers to start bringing those home. Uh, my first computer was one of the Commodore 64s. Uh, but prior to that, he had uh, built a IBM clone out of uh, just, you know, magazines and parts that he'd found. So, and dad was always building crazy stuff. He built almost every piece of furniture and stuff that we had. And, you know, later on, he, uh, you know, when he sold that business, he went to work for, uh, for General Dynamics and then later for Lockheed. And um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But he did some really cool stuff with them. But he was always taking me outside of work. He was always taking me to different events like IEEE. And um, there I got to meet just the most incredible scientists from all over the world and the states. And uh, I would get introduced to people like Boyd Bushman. Um, and later on, when I was actually getting to chair uh, uh, events there, I'd get to meet uh, people like Nick Cook uh, or Mike Melville, who was the Spaceship One pilot. Um, we've had uh, one of the main programmers from IBM's uh, Deep Thought Network come in uh, to speak at, at, at keynote events. I mean, it's just uh, all, all sorts of amazing. Every single, not every single year was I uh, a, a chair there, but always getting exposed to this stuff. So I guess as it ties into SCU, SCU is just a natural progression for me of that, of taking the sort of thing that I've always done for IEEE and seeing now if I can apply it to the to the SCU as well. It's not like I'm a, you know, an expert in any one particular field, but I've been exposed to an intermediate depth of so many fields that I'm able to connect the dots uh, for people on them. Uh, as it sounds to like to sounds like you would be called a kind of a top polymath. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. That would be about right. Yep. Yes. So I would I would call myself a 
polymath. Uh, but so, uh, like you, I was inside the intelligence community, and I heard and saw lots of stuff going on, and I was going, "What is this about?" So I began reading. Naturally, being in the intelligence community, Richard Dolan's UFOs and the National Security State, Volumes 1 and 2. I began following Richard, joined his website, became involved in his forum, finally led the forum, and then he interviewed, and then, uh, uh, of course, uh, contemporaneously with that, this stuff came out in the New York Times and Politico and elsewhere, and I went, the government is admitting this is real. I mean, all this weird stuff I've been hearing, these pictures I've been seeing, and now they're saying it's real out loud. And of course, now we've got the Jill brand a minute. Okay, so Richard Dolan interviewed Chris Bledsoe. And I wrote Chris that says, you know, I'm this scientist. I see that you've had science in your house before. I'm sorry your scientist friend, Hal Povenmire, has passed away. I'd like to come visit and see if we can have some fun together. I didn't hear back from him for three weeks. And finally, he wrote and said, okay, you can come. And I says, well, I'm likely to bring my wife. Is that okay? And he went fine. So well, we hit it off with him. And when I got there, I learned all sorts of stuff, had myriad experiences, which I won't bore the audience with because they heard it multiple times. But I've seen all of the things with my own two eyes that Chris claims, except for the lady. And I saw them with my own eyes. I mean, I don't care what people claim about Chris and his videos. I have seen stuff there with my own eyes. All right. He told me that Jim Simivan said, told him he knew him and to let me in. That's how I got to Chris Bledsoe. And after that experiences, I've had other experiences before. So I decided I would try to do some technical work. And my original goal was to help Chris out because he was taking these shaky handheld phone videos. And I wanted to put some other instrumentalities, other sensors, and do multi-sensor fusion, uh, automated collection where nobody would guess it would his place. And so I started doing some stuff. And eventually uh, that led to uh, other activities and so forth. It was just kind of strange. And uh, I've had paranormal experiences, weird things happen ever since I became friends with Chris Bledsoe. So in 2020, I retired from Virginia Tech as the chief scientist of the Hume Center. And I I uh, stopped being an active member of uh, 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 classified projects. My I turned off, and in May of 2022, uh, I will graduate. I will no longer have an active clearance. It would go into dormant, and if I were to go back in, there would have to be a total multi tens of thousands of dollar background investigation. So, in other words, at my age, it'll never happen. So, there you go. Dave, you got, a, you got a question? Well, I always got questions because I don't have the impressive resume that uh, you guys have. And it, every time you mention your resume, Bob, I just feel like slinking into my chair a little oh. bit. You know? you know, honestly, honestly, at least I could grow better facial hair than you. That's At least I'm really? one up there. I am one up there. You know, but... Let's start to shift this as we got five minutes to go before we got to go to break here on Science Bob and Friends. You know, the UAP subject has been a highly controversial one, Brandon, for the last four years. And, you know, there's many in the UFO community that are very divided on this subject, whether it's the scientific side, whether it's the research side, the technological side, or the experiential side, which is where I like to come from. And that's kind of my background along with this, even though I do have my journalism diploma, you know, but nonetheless, you know, I had to throw my education in there. You, you know, got to compete somehow, but nonetheless, you know, where do you stand on this whole controversy as an outsider who's pretty new looking in to the entire UFO world? Um, well, let's see. Uh, I, I did want to clarify one quick thing a moment ago, uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Bob. Uh, I am not actually a member of the intelligence community, nor have I ever been. 
uh, I just wanted to make sure that, that I wasn't coming across as misrepresenting something there because that's, uh, but I have been surrounded by the aerospace industry uh, as well as a whole lot of very brilliant scientists within it uh, around. So I just wanted to make that real clear. I didn't want to, I didn't want to mis misrepresent anything there. Um, but as far as a newcomer into this, uh, it's fascinating because um, I've had to learn, uh, I've had to learn the transition of thinking that, oh, hey, I actually know the answer to that. I can just call them up and let them know, hey, I know what the answer is. I know what that could be. Or, hey, I know how I could help you with this. And realizing that those channels are mostly closed, that they all closed up after a lot of the disclosure, not disclosure, but the, you know, the waves of stuff started happening. Um, and uh, trying to find where those avenues were to even give any answers or questions for that matter to anyone uh it, trying to track that down was incredibly difficult uh and it it required a rabbit trail just to ever be able to find anyone to talk to in the first place which was a very far cry from what i was seeing on every tv show and hearing from every podcast and reading it from every article which was where are the scientists? Why aren't they looking at this? Why isn't anyone suggesting how we can do something on this? Where's the help? And I'm looking around trying to help and there's no one actually uh, wanting to talk to it. But I'd look, the communities themselves were active, but they were very insular. And I don't mean that as any sort of a disrespect towards the communities or anything, but um, this has been siloed for so long. I think maybe what it sounds like is every, it sounds like the artillery stopped and everyone's kind of poking their heads up and looking around and making sure the shooting's not about to start as far as the sniping of pseudoscience accusations and tinfoil hat and clip art of aliens and things like that. And they're just waiting to see whether or not anyone's really taking this seriously or if it's just going to go right back to the uh, to the land of silliness and ruining professional careers. I'm banking on the former rather than the latter. Uh, I think it's just going to take a whole bunch of people opening dialogue. How do we get that dialogue opening up, though, as we got about one minute to go? Because so many sides here, and there are multiple sides. It's not two sides. There are multiple sides that have literally dug their heels in. I think that answer is going to take a lot more than a minute. But in general, if you were to boil it down into one or two sentences, I'd say it's going to take forgiveness of past sins on every side. It's going to take acceptance of new opinions and ideas on every side and it's going to take a whole lot of human humility on the part of humanity as well as an acceptance that we are actually just minor players on a global stage of intelligence no bucks no buck rogers that's my answer when the bucks flow for work then we'll have stuff mm, yep gotta that's have a another, way to look at it. another way to look at it gentlemen i'm going to get you to hold on right there because we are going to go to break here at the bottom of the hour here. Science Bob and Friends happens the second week of every month where Dr. Bob McGuire, who we call Science Bob around here, puts on his scientific overalls and tells us the who, what, where, when, why of what is going on and maybe even dabbles in a little bit of woo. Tonight's special guest is Brandon Safford. He is from the Scientific Coalition of UAP Studies, and we're glad to have him here as well from the Night Watch Institute. More UAP talk. Let's get a little geeky here, find out what the hell these things are flying in our sky. We'll be back with more Spaced Out Radio when we return on the Mighty SOR. Stay tuned. All right, we're clear. Okay, oh, so when, when we come back, let, let's go into as much detail as you can, Brandon, on what is the Night Watch Institute? What is it? Okay. What, is it what is it? What's its purpose? 
kind of what are the kind of people that are involved and so forth. Get you as much publicity on that as we can. Okay. Can we, uh, can we I, wave at Sharon? As I lied. <laughs> can we wave at Sharon while she's going to bed, please? Come on. I, I lied and just threw up. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, good night, Sharon. Good night. <laughs> we love you. Yes, yes. I don't know why she puts up with me, but she does. And she agreed. <laughs> that, that's why they're always the better half. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Uh, mine's already, I think mine fell asleep probably around 9.39. I'm a... I'm usually already asleep two hours ago by now. I'm an, I'm an old man before his time. Well, the worst of the uh, pandemic where I was sitting around doing this, where all my plans had fallen apart because of COVID, I was going to bed early. Now, my telescope is together. My astrograph, astrophotography cameras are glued on. I have all of that working. And now I usually go to bed just before the sun comes up. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm, usually, I'm usually waking up right about the time the sun comes up uh, or actually beforehand in the winter because, you know, it takes uh, longer for it to rise around here. But uh uh, yeah, I'll go out and it, it, as soon as it gets dark and all the chores are done, I'll go out and I'll sky, sky gaze for a while. And uh, uh, whether I'm looking at stars or clouds or just meditating or whatnot, and then uh, I'll do it again in the morning. Uh, but uh, man, it's just uh, between three kids and school and everything else and uh, honeydew lists and teaching classes in science. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Very nice. Very nice. Uh, Bob, you may want to move your camera over a little bit. Can't hear you. You muted yourself. She's going to bed. She's fine. I tried to get her to turn that light out. It's putting that glow on, but we're giving up. Mm, that darn do science sharing there is just causing all sorts of troubles. Now she's put up with me. She's put up with me, so I'm not calling it trouble. <laughs> mm -hmm. and those are some nice axes you got on the wall there, Dave. Are you a collector? Uh, uh well, the red one and the black one, those are my sons. Ooh. Uh he's our they they're toast already. <laughs> and this this one right here is my daughter's. Mine are in the other room. Cool. I uh, I never had the hands for it. Me um, neither. I'm terrible. <laughs> I, I, I am terrible, and my I, I even suck at my lessons, and uh, um, I'm so uh, frustrated right now. But watching my little guy, who's eight, uh, now starting to learn picking with his fingers is pretty cool. Oh, like claw hammer or something? Or? Yeah, just picking. Cool. Yeah. He, uh, he, he, my, my kid's a metalhead. I'll be honest with you. He's an absolute metalhead. And I thank God because his mother's choice of music is horrible. <laughs> horrible. <clears throat> I, have, I, I have two sons. Both of them, I have two sons and both of them are multi infant people, pianos, guitars, et cetera. And they started that stuff when they were single digit. And they just grew up, and they can just got play anything. They're yeah, that's amazing. cool. It's amazing if you start them young; they can really yeah. go. But they have to be into it. You can't force yeah. it. Yep. My boy, my boy has recently started playing the piano by ear. He'll just go yeah. sit at the piano and just start playing. And I'm like, go for it. Just go for it. Give me a second here, guys. I want to say a big thank you to Smithy, Linda, Science Bob, Nic Nicola, Candy, Phil, and Sinead for the amazing Super Chats. It is a wonderful way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. Don't forget, Saturday, February 26th, Lynn Wallington will be talking women in ufology, a six-hour panel of women talking UFOs and everything in between highlighted by former Navy fighter pilot Alex Dietrich, who will be along with us for that panel as well. It's going to be absolutely wonderful, and we appreciate you tuning us in. 
for that. And don't forget, Vegas, April 22nd to 24th, we have the Spaced Out Radio Fan Party in Las Vegas at the Golden Nugget on Fremont Street. Make sure you go to info at spacedoutradio.com. Let us know if you are coming. Here we go. Second half hour of Spaced Out Radio is underway. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Really do appreciate it. I want to remind you that if you've missed portions of this show or others, check out our free archives at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read Shirky Poo's Newswire. Check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and now on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. We continue on tonight with Science Bob and Friends. Dr. Bob McGuire is here hanging out in a hotel room in Florida. And our special guest from the SCU and Night Watch Institute, Brandon Safford. And gentlemen, we're going to kick this off. Bob, with talking some UFOs and what the hell these things are. I'll let you start the geeking out here, man, because this is where I go into, what? What are they saying? What? Okay, so, uh, Brandon, you, your your Twitter handle is Nightwatch Institute, and you founded this entity. Tell us how, what it is, how it came to be, what it's doing, what are your, what are your aspirations, uh, what kind of people are in it. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, uh, like uh, had been mentioned earlier, I'm the only public facing uh, uh, partner uh, right now, although we do have silent contributors to it that just prefer not yet to, you know, risk careers and, and, and whatnot. But the reason that it initially got founded was out of fear. Uh, when the, the initial narrative that I had seen was, you know, again, keeping in mind a very aerospace oriented family, uh, the uh, admission by the Pentagon about the existence of the UFOs, I saw as a gross violation of U.S. airspace, uh, an imminent act of preparation for war. And I didn't realize yet that there hadn't been hostilities or rather the hostilities that had happened uh now appear to be more incidental or invoked on a uh, part of uh you know the uh whatever human state aggressor had uh, uh, attacked at the time um but as far as just in general i hadn't i didn't i hadn't done enough research yet at the time i hadn't heard yet enough at the time to understand that this didn't appear to be too terribly much of a threat threat per se more just a whatever it is some whatever states they were whatever things they are or collection of entities they are letting us know they're out there but initially night watch started as a civilian effort to monitor the skies for uap activity in response to the aio msg um the 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 oi message the aio msg i, I just call it oi message for short uh, only applies to airborne, uh, unidentified airborne objects within controlled airspace, and that's controlled military airspace. So as far as the volume of the Earth goes, that's a teeny tiny little portion of any part of the Earth at any given point in time. It's like uh, if you had an Olympic-sized stadium and you were only going to monitor a cup holder's worth of information. Um, now I don't, I'm not, I don't blame the military for that. I don't, I, you know, that's, that's their job. They're going to monitor that space. They don't have the budget, the serial number and stuff attached to monitor civilian spaces. If it's not attacking a civilian space and it doesn't appear to be, you know, uh, aggressive, if it, you know, regardless of capability, if it's not demonstrating intent, um, they don't need to respond to it. So uh, gradually, it went from a defensive civilian monitoring effort 
to learning and learning and learning and learning everything I could about it and realizing really what the focus of this should be about is non-human intelligence, at least from my standpoint. Now, whether that, that, no, whether or not that non-human intelligence is extraterrestrial or artificial intelligent or intelligent agent or a terrestrial intelligence that we're not aware of yet or some uh, uh, regret, not regressed, uh, looped civilization or anything like that, uh, the idea of Night Watch Institute at that point became the study of non-prime human intelligence. And so by prime human, I would mean us, presumably all native humans, Earth, this time stream, branch, whatever you want to call it, uh, not necessarily being a looped human or a separated civilization from a prior whatever alien hybrid or whatever a prime human then you would have exohuman uh so uh exohuman would be if again this is an assumption that you had some sort of uh species of human or humanoid that had at some point left earth and went to go live on some other terrestrial body or planet that would be an exohuman if you had, say, a, uh, a uh, Mahabharata type situation where uh, prehistoric civilizations are destroying each other and some of them went below ground, uh, you know, to, to hide and eventually they reemerge. And by that point, Homo sapiens uh, has emerged as the dominant surface life. And this is, I don't know, Homo florensis or Neanderthalus or whatever might have been, you know, back there, if there was some other derivative species of or pre-ancestral species of human, that would be a xenohuman at that point. Basically something outside the norm, but still terrestrially. So non-human intelligence, regardless of whether it's plant, animal, vegetable, mineral, alien, or whatever, that seems to be the core of what people are interested in. They're not interested in UFOs if it's just one dot out there in space that doesn't do anything. They're not interested in if it floats by in a predictable pattern. But if it's doing something intelligent, where it's moving through the sky at unpredictable rates, or if it's suddenly shifting, or it's exhibiting intelligent uh, or emergently intelligent behavior, uh, that implies that we have a lot to learn about it. and whether or not that's in the archives of some deep base surrounding a spaceship or if it's just in a lab that happens to be looking at uh, bacteria that's capable of piloting a, a printed 3D vehicle, um, emergent intelligence and uh, non-human intelligence is just fascinating to me. So that's uh, that's what the Night Watch Institute now is focused around is non-human intelligence. Part of that effort is focused around UAP or what I say uh, UPE, which is unidentified phenomena and entities. Uh, that covers a lot more ground. It allows for transmedium vehicles uh, uh, like USOs or UOOs or whatnot. Um, so if you have an unidentified phenomena or entity, that could also include things like Steve, uh, which if you're familiar with Steve, it's, it's this uh, weird beam that'll just shoot out of the Arctic every now and then for no apparent reason and you can catch it on camera. So if you ever, if you ever look at, uh, I, I think it's my Twitter, uh, or whatever it is I got on the Twitters, the avatar. Uh, on there, you can see the little beam coming out. That's Steve. That'd just be a phenomenon. I mean, it's not necessarily a craft. It's not an object. It's an, un it's an entity. Or if you did the stuff that's going on with Skinwalker Ranch, if you have a what looks like a gate opening up in the sky or something like that, that's not necessarily an object or, a, you know, an, a, a, an entity. That would be a phenomenon. So... Uh, it also allows for possible of... Uh, additional encounters, second kind, third kind, fourth kind, fifth kind. Uh, if you encounter 
a Xeno entity or an Exo entity or something like that walking across the landscape or flapping towards you through the air or swimming towards you in the water, it allows for that as well. Um, a, a better classification of it. I guess you could say a marriage of ufology and cryptozoology, if you will, uh, but in a context which science can frame. That, in turn, ends up begging the question of life. We've never really, as a, at least in Western culture, nailed down what the definition of life is. And most of our Western uh, scientific studies have centered around OCHEM, uh, organic chemistry-based explanations for life, that it has to happen this particular way or that particular way. And like the most radical idea that people are proposing uh, in most cases is something like a silicon-based or a saline-type life, when really, if you get down to it, all life requires is a process by which energy and mass convert to a more complex form and then take that function and replicate it indefinitely. And if you can get something to keep replicating itself like that indefinitely, provided it's got the energy and mass to continue doing so, that's proto-life. From there, it's just a natural progression of intelligence. So anywhere in the universe, not just Earth, anywhere in the universe that you have mass being acted upon by energy, you have the potential for a function to develop that transfers that into a more complex state. And if it's a more complex state and it can keep doing that and keep replicating it, those can eventually hit an even more complex state and so on and so forth. Uh, now, up, in, up until recently, it was thought, you know, that would just be completely impossible because uh, uh, mutations and evolution would only happen via random mutations that happen once every few million years. But in fact, the science is now showing that, uh, in point of fact, DNA, se uh, not DNA, uh, evolution seems to work from uh, various directions at once. So you don't just have the random mutations that pop up. You've also got a weird semi Lamarckian effect where, you know, they. Uh, where if you happen to be in an environment where it's always wet all the time, then you're more likely to suddenly develop traits that are going to let you deal with wetness more often or dryness or heat or cold or so on and so forth. And um, so taking that to the next logical step, all evolution really requires is that the mass and energy function that was working before get a little bit more complex than the time before it. And if it can learn how to loop in other functions and processes that aren't related to it, it can get much more intelligent, like tool use or fire or, uh, you know, building structures and things. And uh, if it can get to the point where it's not just co-opting natural processes and things around itself, but it can co-opt other life forms into itself, then it's even more advanced. And, and so forth. So if you if you take that to its logical conclusion and then consider the volume of the earth is way more than the surface area and then think of it like an onion comparatively if you just want to kind of visualize the whole volume of the earth as an onion. Humanity only lives on the outermost onion skin layer. And even then, only the tattered shreds that happen to be poking, you know, above the ocean. That doesn't include all the layers of onion beneath it all the way down to the core. It doesn't include the gaseous layers of onion that are existing around it when you cut into it. And all of those places have mass. They have energy that can be acting upon them. And you could have life forming in that kind of environment in the magnetosphere. You could have it forming inside of volcanoes at the bottom of oceans and developing very complex systems through things completely unrelated to organic life. Let's look a little bit about one thing. Uh, you know, Alex Dietrich is coming on and I hope the ladies uh, ask Alex to describe the following incident. We're very lucky 
in many ways that the, tr the missions that were going on on the Nimitz were training missions because the minute those fighter pilots had their radar jam, if they had had weapons, they, free, they are free to engage because that's an act of war. We are really lucky they did, were not carrying warheads because I just tell you that's you, people jam you. They have they don't have good intent. I mean that's the assumption militaries have to make. If you're jamming, me, it's for nefarious purposes. We are very lucky. I hope they ask Alex about that in the program uh, this, that's coming up because that is an in, that is one single instant, instance of something that is not necessarily benign. And that we could go over many others there, but I I agree with you that I think most of the people in the Air Force and National Security Council and elsewhere don't really see all of this as necessarily uh, negative or antagonistic or harmful or so forth. But their existence, without understanding their purpose, imply a potential national security threat and all we need is a simple answer why are they here and why are they doing this and we can stop worrying dave uh, you got a question yes i always have a question and it's more of a comment type question because i don't think science can solve that i know i'm at the minority of this two-thirds of brain power here between science bob and and Brandon, but let me explain something to you here. I don't believe, and it's my opinion, there might be others who agree with me, that you can solve the alien issue without starting to be more like Gary Nolan and take the experiential side along with it. Because as an experiencer, I really do believe that if we tapped into more of these experiencer brains and, and actually recorded what they have gone through from radiation to maybe downloads or whatever it may be, I think there's where the answers are. Trying to get a fighter to intercept, a primitive fighter compared to their whatever their craft are, and let's face it, they would be considered primitive, okay, is not going to do it. Sending satellites into space is not going to do it. What it is going to do is waste billions of dollars looking for something that you can't solve up in space when you could solve it potentially here on the planet. Brandon, what are your thoughts? Um, I, uh, I, I agree and disagree 100% on both counts. Um, I, don't, I, no longer, uh, I no longer think that any of these problems is going to be solved with just one thing or another. And I also no longer think that the phenomena, as it were, is any one source, um, much like uh, Lou Alessandro and, and Mellon and Fugel and Bard and uh, so many others have uh, implied or outright stated, it appears to be a combination of a lot of phenomena, uh, uh, phenomena, a lot of different actors uh, and some of them probably human state actors, but if you weed all of those out, you're still left with a lot of stuff that is just so completely inexplicable. And your acceptance of that, not you specifically, but people's acceptance of that is going to come down to many different levels. Let's just consider the top five possibilities of it, you know, in order of least woo to most woo, uh, and consider well, that any... Oh, Before sure. you kind of go on on that, I agree with you. What I'm saying is, and maybe I misrepresented it, there has to be a combination of it. Oh, it's yeah. not that it's not like we got to throw out mainstream science and only listen to the woo partners here. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is we have to be we have to bridge that gap and realize that there is something happening. We have test subjects, mm -hmm. millions of test subjects who just want to know what happened to them, would volunteer, not even get paid for it, 
volunteer just to learn. And that's what I'm saying. I agree. Again, 100% with that. Uh, and there are other institutions that are testing for that and similar sorts of things as far as the uh, experiencer uh, effect goes. Um, I One of the ones that immediately comes to mind that's probably familiar with a lot of your audience is the IONS Institute. Um, and uh, I, I believe one of the other ones is the Rhine uh, Institute. Uh, Ronin Institute might be uh, another one that's uh, interested in, in looking at that. Uh, as far as the SCU goes, as far as I know, um, the the last, uh, I guess, uh, the last read I got on, on them uh, is that it's going to be more about specifically in the areas of UAP and the craft and whatnot, as opposed to the experiencers themselves. But as far as scientists or clergy or anyone going out there, yeah, I mean, part of the science itself is experiencing it. So as part of my studies, um, I've delved into the experiential part of it as well, taking notes and trying to treat it as I would uh, any other experiment. Mm hmm. Science Bob, we've got three minutes. Yes, yeah, so um, uh, scientists are brought up in a certain context, and this context gives them tools, laboratories, places to go to, etc. It's just hard to see how mainstream scientists are going to operate outside of that context. So they've got tools. They got a hammer, they're looking for a nail. And so until we broaden the perspective and 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 again, I say it's say it until funding is available for them to try things, they need to pay for the lab, they need to pay for their students, they need to pay for their staff, and so forth. Um, when all of that is available, I think we'll have quite a few people do some kind of science around UAP. Now, it looks to me like NDAA is going to lead to lines in the budget whenever an actual budget ever gets passed that will allow funded research, but it'll be from places like DARPA and, and uh, 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 three-letter agencies and so forth. I think it's going to be a little while while they gather data, they're doing observational science. And once observational science leads to hypotheses, we might see some grants coming out of the National Science Foundation, Air Force Office for Scientific Research, AFOSR, the National, the Navy Research Labs, and so forth, where they're doing fundamental research. Hey, we've got this bunch of phenomenon. Now we got a little money. Let's get some students and go do some work because uh, that's what a professor does. He goes and tells his students what work to do for him <laughs> uh, while, while their education paid for and a degree out of it. I mean, look, we have to understand scientists are constrained by how they make a living and the, the context in which they have to operate. And so that's just a comment on you're not going to see people get degrees in woo until woo is funded. It's just the way it is. It very much is the way it is. Gentlemen, we got you for one more hour here on Sun Science Bob and Friends. Dr. Bob McGuire, formerly of Virginia Tech University, retired, and from the Scientific Coalition of UAP Studies, as well as, uh, I'm sorry here, all of a sudden I drew a blank here, Night Watch Institute, sorry, I don't know why I all of a sudden blanked on that. We have Brandon Stafford, or Safford, I'm just butchering everything. Can we just get to commercial? Honestly, can we just get to commercial? <laughs> Space Out Radio, Hour 2, Science Roll bumper, roll French. bumper. <laughs> yeah, roll it, man. Just get me out of here. Not enough woo to inject into my system. Science Bob and Friends continues on Spaced Out Radio. I'll learn how to talk during the break. We'll be right back. Yeah, for what it's worth, all you did was add a T. I've had people add W's, N's, uh, you name it. 
Mm. Oh, we lost Bob. No, he's still there. Oh, he okay. just turned his camera off a little bit so he could yeah. go give his wife a smooch. Oh, there we go. Yeah. All right. Um, let's say hello to Mitchell Darling. How are you? Game Vet, good to see you. Uh, Latro, Magnus Vermagnuson, Asteroid, good to have you all here. The gorgeous Gloria from Casual Conversation. The lovely Teresa. Thank you for joining us. And who else am I missing here that came in late? That's about it. That's about it. Drew Morris, what's happening? All right. Oh, uh, let's see here. What are we talking about in the chat room here? I don't know. What are my rules in the chat room? Usually if Jules is dropping a hammer here, she's got a point. Let me just take a little peek here. Oh, yes. No COVID talk in the chat room, people. You know better than that. You know better. We don't talk that uh, stuff or politics. or Unless you're insulting Justin Trudeau, there is absolutely no politics talk here in our channel. All right? You don't want none of this, America. You don't want none of this. Trust me on that. Uh, no, the convoy hasn't made, well, it's kind of starting. I think, uh, yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to just. Reminds me of a joke. <coughs> uh-huh. From way back in the Cold War, so it's safe. Uh, it was, uh, way back in the Cold War, uh, to uh, uh, a Russian and an American friend are, are each chatting over the phone and they're talking about how great their respective countries are. And, uh, and the, uh, the American says, you know, well, in America, uh, I can go right out into my front lawn and I can shout to hell with Ronald Reagan and nothing will happen to me. And the Russian says, ha, huh, silly American. I could go right in the middle of Red Square and shout to hell with an old Reagan and nothing would happen to me. <laughs> That's awesome. I, yeah, it was okay. Uh, it loses something in the telling, I suppose. Probably in four decades, too. Uh, I bet there are people in the people in the chat room that might go, Ronald who? Yeah, yeah, I just that just occurred to me. That just occurred to me. Um, all yeah, right, we've TV got a long time ago. You know, Ryan Sprague and a couple of the others, uh, I've I've heard uh, raise a really good point on that. Uh, there's whole generations now that are two generations removed from the Roswell incident. And as far as they're concerned, it's ancient history. It's as ancient history to them as the war of 1812 was to us. So, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, look, I mean, it, uh, I believe that something major happened. And the reason is all of the researchers that, you know, Dave and I, and probably, you know, have gathered all of this, documentary proof coupled with uh, from people that lived in the area that's you don't have semi-trailer trucks with flatbeds and tarps pulling a deflated balloon out of the desert. You just don't. That's because so, they're all in Ottawa right now. They're all in Ottawa right now. Yes. Those are some good balloons that they flew all the way from New Mexico to Ottawa. But, and I, I love the fact that they claim Roswell was Mogul when Mogul started five years after Roswell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Gentlemen, we've got about 90 seconds. All right. 
And I, I just want to say a quick hello to everyone uh, listening in on tonight's show. We really do appreciate it. Thank you to all the veterans. You always have a safe place here in our chat rooms. We love you and thank you for your service. Big thank you to our super chatters tonight. Smithy, Linda, Science Bob, Nicola, Candy, Phil, and Sinead. The, the super chat is a wonderful way to support what we do on this show. By the way, the new schedule for Vegas is going up on the website soon, April 22nd to 24th. We were going to spread it out, but we said hell with it. Let's just all gather at the Golden Nugget on Fremont Street. So far, we got 30 fans signed up. I'm excited. We're going to have a live show. We've got the conference room already booked. And, uh, yeah, we want you to come. Big we want name, you to come. Show, big name showing up. Yeah. Science Bob is going to be there. Not a big name, Joel's but other bit really big names are showing up. That's right. Science Sharon is going to be there, you know, and and George Knapp, uh, Jim Goodall, Michael Schratt is going to be there. I'm already fangirling over that. You know, you're probably going to see me cry when I see Michael Schratt. Honestly, I love the man's research so much, uh, but we're going to get that going. And don't forget, February 26th, Women of Ufology on our uh, YouTube channel. Here we go. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook Spaced Out Radio Show. Here we go with our number two of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears, wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Join us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do old Davy the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Paboosh! Pabouche is your password. I wonder if it's Pabouche. No, there'd be an R on the end. Pabouche. We're going to call it that. Or as the Americans would say, Pabouch. Pabouch. Use it wisely, space travelers, as the clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot, reading Shirky Poo's Newswire. Check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, as well as on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. Let's get back to Science Bob and friends. We got it for another hour here, where Dr. Bob McGuire comes in once a month to skip the woo, but get into the who, what, where, when, why, and how of everything strange and supernatural. Tonight, we are joined by Night Watch Institute's Brandon Safford. He is coming from us with from uh, the Scientific Coalition of UAP Studies as well. Gentlemen, welcome back and thank you. And Science Bob, I'll let you take the lead here. Great. So um, people that have been on here know, know that I'm a scientist. They know I have a degree in, in science. I've done science. I was a chief scientist of an institute. But they've also learned that I've had weird experiences. I've had missing time. Orbs in my house, seen craft, uh, been visited in the middle of the night and had things recorded that I didn't know happened, supposedly Even with Dave, but I don't know. I mean, it's just all weird. I, the stuff is weird. And so as a scientist, I'm interested in what I can figure out about that. Have you had experiences? I have, in, I have indeed. Uh, and... It's one of those things that I still struggle with trying to share because uh, from the very first time I was caught having the experiences, I was told not to do it. Um, so when I, the very first, the very first ones that I can remember, uh, I would be at my grandparents' house and there were stars for lack of a better word uh they were golden stars uh there were they they weren't like stars in the sky like little dots and they weren't 
they looked like cartoon like you like if you got a marker and drew in the sky uh, a, a you know an image a messy image of a star and put it there uh and within it were things that waved and they would motion they would make sounds i didn't really know what they were it didn't occur to me that they shouldn't be there and they would you know i'd laugh at them and i'd talk to them i was i don't know four five something like that and one night my grandmother came out and she saw me talking to them and she yelled at them and she yelled at me and she told me don't ever talk to them again and then she don't talk about them don't talk to them don't look at them okay I did what I said, I did what, you know, grandma told you to do something, you did it, you know. Uh, she didn't have to give me a reason. If you asked for a reason, you got more chores, you know. Uh, so, uh, you know, anytime, and, and then if you kind of couple that, uh, I grew up in a very, very, very strict church. Um, it was, uh, you know, those, those familiar with the Christian faith and Baptists, uh, you may be familiar with uh, Bereans, which is a very, very strict offshoot of, of Baptist, uh, to the point where they'd say even kneeling and, you know, watching TV was sinful because it was kneeling in front of an idol. And so any remote thing on Wu there, you don't talk about, you don't look at it, you don't mention it. Well, then when, you know, dad stopped working in the software hardware industry and goes to work for the aerospace industry. And I find that, you know, if you see something strange, you don't mention it. You don't talk about it because there's a good chance that it was either a black ops project or, you know, you just weren't supposed to, you know, the people who needed to handle it, handle it. So um, even in my tribe, because I'm, I'm a, a Sac and Fox Native American, um, and the Sauk tribe, uh, I mean, we had the old ways and the lore and uh, whatnot uh, killed, literally brutally killed out of us. Uh, a lot of us ended up, not me personally, but a lot of our tribe had to go to the, like the Carlisle Indian School for boys to, you know, kill the Indian, save the man uh, thing, which, you know, to be, uh, that, that is its own that is its own collection of plus and minuses there. But I mean, it's just, like I said, my whole life has been a collection of see no evil, speak no evil, talk, you know, just, it just pretended the Fnords. If you ever read the Illuminatus trilogy, you know, it's like the Fnords. If you don't see the Fnords, they, they, they can't hurt you. So when you suddenly get permission uh, to start, looking at that stuff and you start remembering everything that you've seen and everything that you've done and everything that you've witnessed over the years and trying to square that with what you've been told about reality in the past versus what you now know reality to be more like uh it's it can get very confusing, you know. It's it's a combination of you know uh, professional credibility as well as personal sanity. At what point do you ask yourself, "Did I make that up? Am I remembering wrong? I was not supposed to talk about it, so maybe the reason I wasn't supposed to talk about it is because it wasn't actually there, and they just didn't want me to be the neighborhood crazy kid, you know? Who knows? It's a so. Did I experience stuff? Do I remember experiencing stuff? Yes, often on my entire life, even as recently as a day ago. Do I talk about it very much? No, hardly at all. In fact, okay, great. Uh, so, did, did, uh, I, what was the name of your tribe again? Uh, Sack and Fox. Sack yeah, and Fox. Okay. So, do you yeah. tell us what the tell what the center of gravity for the Sack and Fox tribe is, and do they have something akin to the Anasazi uh, lore for sky people in their heritage. So, uh, let's see. Okay, so they were uh, front-loading it. They were a Great Lakes tribe. Um, they were probably the first tribe that Lewis and Clark encountered. 
Uh, I believe uh, the, the, the favorite quote among the tribe is if they had known then what they knew now, they'd have just shot the canoes and sunk them then and there. Uh, but um, they were actually uh, two separate tribes living on an island in the Great Lakes. And uh, it was the Sauk tribe. And uh, and now I'm blanking on the name. Uh, Muskok. Muskaki, I, I'm, I'm going to catch some flack for that later. But the Sauk is actually the tribe that I was descended from. But when Lewis and Clark were cataloging all of this, they grouped these two tribes together. And it, the, 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 the M portion of the tribe uh, or the island got mistaken for another tribe that was Fox. And so they just all got lumped in as one name, Sack and Fox, and then uh, their stuff taken, and then they got sent down into the like Stroud, Oklahoma area. So their center of gravity is currently, uh, well, half the tribe is way up further in like Montana and, and that area, and they separated legally from the whole rest of the nation, uh, the tribal nation a long time ago. But the tribe itself that I'm from is, yeah, they're in the uh, Oklahoma territory. Uh, as far as mythology goes, um, the one I'm most familiar with uh, actually uh, reads more like a post-apocalyptic legend than anything else. Uh, where um, so the the the, the uh, allegory and, and it was it was interesting in uncovering this because this is this was a thing that had kind of gotten lost for a while. So it's it's it's, it's kind of nice to be able to bring this up. Uh, this was kind of lost in tribal memory. Uh, one year, uh, when I was thinking of actually competing at the powwows uh, in you know, forming my own regalia, I went to the tribal library to start looking up uh, symbols from the tribe and colors and things like that that were traditional. I really wanted to tap into the older roots of the tribe. And I came across this awesome looking symbol. Uh, and it was like this... Uh, it was it was a picture of like three different things and it was like a medicine pouch and a bag and a quiver or something like that but the medicine bag uh had an emblem of a of a cat with a really long tail that went all the way around it and so i sketched it down as best i could and the reference caption on it only said the underwater panther as depicted by the sack and fox tribe on this medicine bag or whatever now, years and years and years later, I would actually get to see this medicine bag at the Trammell Crow building in Dallas. But uh, up until that point, the only thing we had was that one picture from that one book. And I went from tribal member to tribal member trying to track down the origin story of this. And it just so happened that one of my relatives was old enough to remember the legend. And uh, it actually ended up being one of the origin stories of the tribe. And so... Uh, uh, metaphorically speaking, or literally, or folklorically, uh, the a long time ago there was a huge cataclysmic flood that went into the Great Lakes area, and it trapped a panther within its cave, and it lived there uh, for a very long time uh, with no availability to food, but the otter. Uh, saw that the panther was trapped up into the cave and would swim other, under it and deliver gifts of fish and whatnot to the tribe. Uh, I'm not to the tribe, I'm sorry, to the panther. And eventually, uh, as the floodwaters receded, the panther was able to escape and live, uh, but it would have starved to death otherwise. So otter became sacred to the tribe, as did the underwater panther. And the whole allegorical, metaphorical, or literal, however you want to take it, story of it got represented as the beaver the further south the tribe went when they weren't really dealing with panthers so much anymore, but they had a beaver that looked like uh, kind of the same thing. It creates its own underwater cave uh, and shares with river otters and stuff. Anyway, I suspect that's how the tribe eventually went from the underwater panthers to becoming uh, the different clan system, one of which was the uh, beaver clan of which I'm descended. So it was this neat little full circle thing that I found the symbol from the original proto clan from which I had been descended all the way back and it taps into this great flood origin story. It was so yeah, 
uh, as far as aerial. No, I'm sorry. sorry. I just want to tell Dave, let's warn the audience that we're going to take uh, audience questions and have them line them up and capitalize them so you can easily find them. Yeah, that is really interesting. So nothing so much UFO like it's just an interesting mythology surrounding a a totem or a critter uh, that was very important to the tribe and had no, it's under UFO stuff. Oh, good. Oh, good. Good. Okay, oh, tell yeah. us some UFO stuff. Well, it's <laughs> um. So I'm sorry, but that you're allowed to tell. Lots of tribes don't like this kind of stuff well, talked about. It's not so much of what you're allowed to tell. And well, I mean, I, for some of the tribes, it is. For, it's just that the, the legends aren't necessarily ours. It's kind of a collection of tribal language, uh, not languages, uh, uh, throughout. So it could very well be like some of them are absolutely ridiculous. Uh, there's a legend of the flying butt, for instance, that just this butt flies through the air and it was supposed to be the butt of this very angry woman and her head would fly one way and the butt would fly the other way uh you've got legends like uh far more majestic like the thunderbird uh that um you know you could either take it uh figuratively speaking as uh like a uh you know a lightning formation or a fire formation or if you start looking further north into, say, the Eskimo and Inuit areas in the far north, uh, they actually have literal legends of these huge megafauna birds that would come down at it and get it. Um, it throughout several indigenous cultures, the idea of UFOs uh, being either in relation to being descended from the stars or uh, just being a uh, either a spirit realm or even just something from a different realm of the earth itself, such as something that actually literally lives within a volcano or literally lives down within a lake. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, you see, I guess... Uh, uh, as far as uh, ghosts or entities, uh, cryptozoological things, um, uh, again, that also uh, is going to again vary from tribe to tribe per se. But you've got acceptances of those varying from you know if you go real far south into like mestizo lands, uh, like Mexico, Central America. Uh, places like that, um, the idea of there being a natural and a supernatural is it, it, it's a very hazy boundary there. The, the boundary between that is as hazy as trying to figure out what is the actual water line and what's the beach line when you're looking at the foam hitting, hitting the waves. But you might have other tribes or within the tribe even beliefs that it could that such things absolutely could not be. But one of the things that you do find over and over again uh, in almost every indigenous culture, wherever I've looked, is an earth, air, fire, water, and akasha slash spirit slash celestial component, like a five elemental system. And in some cases, they tend to be different. I think in China, uh, they have wood and metal as a... Uh, uh, some of the basic four elements instead. Um, and you see the same energy dynamics uh, going in and out as well among indigenous cultures. So again, in Eastern philosophies, you might have yin and yang, but in South Indian indigenous cultures, you might have Tama versus Raja energy or uh, in... Um, in other cultures, you might have a demonic versus a uh, angelic uh, energy. Um, as a scientist, I've I've kind of taken those across the board, and I just kind of I've created a mentally a Cartesian graph of uh, trying to visualize any life form uh, in terms of two different vectors. 
And the first is whether it's moving in the same temporal vector to us. So is it traveling at the same speed and direction through time or a different one? Uh, and also uh, its comparative energy and mass density. So if something is more dense mass-wise than us and uh, less energetic, it's sub-informative. You have less information being processed, less energy, more mass. But if you have less mass and more energy, it's a super informative in, uh, entity. And so that kind of seems to provide uh, a very similar dynamic uh, in, you know, if you have yin energy, that seems to be more sub-informative. Yang energy would be super-informative. Tama energy would be uh, sub-informative. Raja would be super-informative. Uh, celestial, angelic, super-informic. Demonic would be sub-informative. Uh, so that's kind of the way I think of them now in terms of if you use humans, just the human experience as an average central baseline point, uh, you could figure out how a human would compare to any other entity based on its relative mass and energy density, its gravimetric energy per se, and its temporal vector. Dave? Yes, we have a question coming from uh, Matt here, who is asking, what do you think about the titanium isotopes mentioned in Gary Nolan and Jacques Vallée's research? Do you want to take that one, Science Bob? Um, oh, well, I find it very interesting. I, so the things to me that I don't know that are really necessary is uh, the the lineage of the isotopes. Uh, what what is the who who found them? How did they get them? What, which hands did they pass through? What were the exact tests they ran? How and what methodologies they used and so forth um, to to arrive at the conclusions. So it's really interesting. But I as a as a scientist familiar with how that science is done in some cases and in some context, I need more details before I'm going to give it an A. Uh, I guess my own response on uh, the question would be, uh, I, 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 we touched upon it in a Twitter conversation earlier. I would say if it was a human state actor that produced a craft, any isotopic thing could probably be thought of as a trace number instead of a specific uh, inherently meta metaphysical quality, uh, as it were. So if you had an ultra secret craft that you didn't want to put any serial numbers on and you didn't want to have any identification whatsoever, and if it crashed, and you needed to somehow figure out if it was yours or someone else's, the way I would do it is I'd encode it with an isotope that was unusual, and then that way I could find that isotope and I'd know it was mine or I'd know it was someone else's if it didn't have it. Uh, but as far as the properties of titanium, like a T, what was it, T49, I think that had been asked about, uh, as best I can tell, where it would be really most useful would be creating the skin uh, or the shell of a craft um, uh, to provide a nice electrostatic uh, coating. Um, it seems a reasonable uh, metal to use as well, especially if you're if you had a UAP that was reported as like white or gray or something like that, because that's going to be roughly the you know the color of such a thing. I think that's like the powder form at least. Gentlemen, I'm going to get you to hold on right there. we got 30 minutes left to go here on Spaced Out Radio's Science Bob and Friends with Dr. Bob McGuire, who is sporting a very, very nice pair of uh, denim overalls. Very jealous over that. And our good friend, new friend, Brandon Sanford from Nightwatch Institute, who could pass for Egon on the Ghostbusters with that fantastic hair. Yep. I said it. I've been waiting all night to say it. And that is a compliment, my friend. Thank you. Science Bob okay. and friends. Stangler is one of my favorites. On Spaced Out Radio. Mm -hmm.
All right, we're clear. All we'll right, go to Steve. Great. We'll go to Steve's question next, and uh, that's where we'll kick off the sec, the last uh, portion here. This is so much fun. Thank you all for having me on this. Boy, oh, that and a half hours gonna blink and it'll be gone. I know, right? I feel like we've only we been have here, people that are reluctant to come on. It's either late or they think don't think they have two and a half hours. Of, nah. By the time Dave and I get through interacting and asking questions, two and a half hours, two and a half hours is blinked and gone. I think I, I think uh, in the initial, the very first conversation Dave and I had over the phone, even I was like. Well, I don't know. It's really late, and I'm an old man, and I got the day job. And I'm like, and now I'm really, really glad that I, you know, toughed it out and brewed some coffee. Good. Yeah. I, I think I think a downside is it's on a Wednesday, but again, we haven't had a problem. No, it's not, I, I guess it's not really a downside. This is fun. This is the kind of thing I used to just sit in coffee shops and and do for hours on end talking with other people oh um, yes oh yes yeah see I, I the thing that covid's just harmed me so badly is all of my collaborations are in person and, and it's in you know you're you're hanging out you're getting to know the people trying to figure out who's who's trustworthy and so forth uh, and that's that's a part of my my upbringing and uh, my experience and all the time I spent working for the government, you really need to figure out who you can trust. So that actually touches on something interesting that you said earlier uh, that uh, I, I, had, I had completely forgotten to mention. Um, uh, and, and that was uh, how the speed of science is changing. And so that might be wow. an interesting thing to de delve into later. Oh but, um, my goodness! Yeah, yeah, we are, we are, we are, we are, we are very close to having a group of technologies that, taken together, science and the 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 number of bits and qubits of information that science and engineering are going to produce is going to increase so rapidly. No one human can keep up even close. Oh yeah, uh, and 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 I think these types of platforms are going to be the key to that. I had never even considered using social media as a way to try and do scientific institutional research, except for the random comment of my youngest son when I was driving him to school one day. And I was like, so what do you want to do when you grow up? And he's like, I want to be really big on YouTube or Twitter. I was like, why? And he's like, because I want a whole bunch of followers. I want tens of thousands of oh, followers. My and son's I, too. Well, I thought, you know, at the time, be, again, not thinking outside of my own shell, I thought, well, how shallow is that just to want followers for no other reason? But it's, their, it's, the, it's, the, it's their content. It's their, it's their groups. They want well, followers. Well, what I did instead was ask him. I, I said, why do you want followers? Because instead of just shutting him down, I asked him why. And he said, because that's that many more people that can help me solve problems and whose problems I can help solve. And it blew my mind. Good answer. It, that was the moment at which I realized things like Twitter and, and uh, you know, the other, the pin tweets and stuff, uh, they can be scientific collaborations that speed up progress exponentially instead of having ivory towers of people who are in silos researching siloed information and having it peer reviewed over the course of years and months by siloed people. Instead, you can have exactly the right kind of experts you need from all over the world collaborating at the speed of tweets on solving problems and that that gives me all sorts of hope for how science and the community and the phenomena is gonna be worked out all right gentlemen i'm gonna get you to hold on right there i want to say a big thank you tonight to Excaliperful, Sinead, Phil, Candy, Nicola, Bob, Linda, and Smithy for the great super chats. Really do appreciate the love and the great support that you give us on Spaced Out Radio. 
and uh, Excalibur full. I'll get to your question here in just a little bit. Uh, reminder, February 26th is a Saturday. Lynn Wallington will be having the Women in Ufology Conference on our YouTube channel. Six hours of UFO talk, including fighter pilot Alex Dietrich. And if you haven't joined Merle's and my new channel, Canada's Great Unknown, I'm going to go find the link. I'm going to put it in the chat room. I'd love it if you subscribe. Here we go. We pass a halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate it. I want to remind you that if you've missed portions of this show or others, check out our free archives at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor. Hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot. Read up on Shirky Poo's Newswire. Check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, as well as TikTok, Spaced Out Radio. Final segment of Science Bob and Friends tonight. Dr. Bob McGuire is here along with Night Watch Institute's Brandon Safford. And we are hanging out. We're going to get to your questions as well, gentlemen. We're going to start off with Steve's question here. How do you go about discerning truth from fiction in the UFO subject, Brandon? <laughs> That's been something I've really had to contend with lately. Uh, because when you witness stuff that, or when you witness, observe, or research and find information on stuff that does not conform with anything that previously fit your notion of reality, um, you have to ask yourself that question every single time. And so personally, I've set up a system of checks and balances of does this check with what I personally know to be true? If it doesn't check with what I know to be true, does it check with what I know to be right? If it doesn't check with what I know to be right, then I listen and I observe and I record and I analyze. And if I can't come up with a solid answer on that, then um, I just, I go back and try and do more research. If I come up with an answer for it, I see if it checks with what I know and I wash, rinse, repeat. Very cool. Uncle Dale down in Texas, who's an amazing power stash, says, get these men some facial hair. <laughs> I agree, Uncle Dale. I totally agree. Terrible that they bring out the blades. I know. I know your pain. Uh, let's get to another question here. This one comes from Excaliperful. Do you think if more academics had initiatory experiences, then they would be more open to studying the phenomena? If so, could it be as simple as having them stay with experiencers as a program? I'm going to answer the first question as yes. I think if... I think it would vary from person to person. Honestly, um, even among non-scientists, uh, scientists and non-scientists, you're going to have people who just aren't ready to confront the kind of problems uh, that it poses to reality, especially if you have a very humanocentric view of uh, how the world's supposed to operate. If you think that humans are the end-all, be-all, top of the food chain, if you think that we have perfectly secure airspace, if you think we're the, uh, that we have a firm grasp on what reality is and is not, uh, then experiencing might open your eyes and it might scare you away. Um, alternately, on the part of the second question, if someone doesn't, uh, if someone doesn't believe and you have someone who does believe, it's going to take a bridge between them unless the two of them already believe to some extent or don't believe to some extent. You've got to have some sort of a Venn diagram of context between them. And that can usually be found. 
So I just want to point out that Excalibur Peripheral's first question was quantity. If a if a hundred people had experiences and none of them believed before, would a bunch of them begin to believe? after they've had the experiences and the answer is a simple yes because yeah. they're going to trust their own senses i agree and that i've, I've observed that same thing on uh, at least on the twitters uh but also otherwise that people who were like myself even very skeptical previously become way more open-minded uh the first experience and every progressive experience thereafter I want to ask both you guys something because I want to expand on this question. A couple weeks ago, Jim Semivan, one of the co-founders of the To The Stars Academy, and who has been highly influential on the weird desk of many alphabet agencies, came out publicly and told the story we already knew, many of us, that he's an experiencer. Him and his wife were taken and saw beings, gray beings, inside their bedroom. Okay, long story short, when you get somebody of Jim Semivan's reputation where he may not be the biggest name publicly, but he is a massive name within the alphabet agencies, how does this change the game moving forward, Science Bob? So I can just tell you that my personal experience is I knew lots of people in the intelligence community. Because I had a broad reach, worked all over it and so forth. And as it became that I was had become a believer and stuff started coming out, I personally witnessed people changing their mind. And I'm talking about people that once a month or so go to the White House and deal with stuff at the White House. All of a sudden they were going, you know, I thought you were crazy, but I know now you're not. And so that's just, just a sea change. And now, look, if President Biden did not want the National Defense Authorization Act to have the Gillibrand Amendment, it never would have seen a light of day. So that amendment to the NDAA had broad support in the intelligence community, in the military community, in the homeland security community, in the criminal justice community, and in the White House and the National Security Council, and even amongst some of our allies, or it never would have made it. Because what's in the NDAA and the way we spend our budget affects all of our allies. So I'm just telling you, this got broad support now if you understand how all of this stuff works. Okay, but how does how does that change the outlook with somebody of Jim Semivan's accountability and credibility coming out as an experiencer now? Because for so long, for the first four years of the To The Stars Academy's history, we weren't allowed to talk ET contact. We weren't allowed to talk aliens. They did a great job at segregating the entire topic, which I think caused a lot of unnecessary division within the UFO community. And now he yeah, comes out they, as... I was going to tell you, they didn't care about the UFO community. They cared about the U.S. government saying it was real and funding activities and so forth. Uh, people that are in the UFO community aren't going to impact that uh, in, in any significant way. What they wanted was congressional here. Look, Chris Mellon got on Twitter and said, hey, you know, out loud, I think these I think these tic tacs were ET. Now I don't know that. I don't have evidence to prove it, but I believe it. So I mean yes things have changed dramatically. And Sim Evans is contributory to that. Brandon, your thoughts. Uh I I'm Pretty much in agreement. I, I've, I, one of the things I really wish that more of the UFO community understood uh, is that nothing happens without a serial number. Now you could name this, you could call the serial number whatever you want, an invoice number, a billing number, uh, an RFP, whatever. Uh, but if you don't have a bill code uh, to to bill it to, it doesn't happen. There's not a person there to execute the action. There's not resources for them to execute that action on. 
and there's not materials getting shipped or anywhere to do anything with. And those serial numbers don't get created unless you have a project that calls for the necessity of whatever those serial numbers are going to reference in terms of their billing. And you're not going to have a project unless there's an act of Congress or, you know, budgeting within the military that allocates beans and bullets towards that. Now, in the military context, that is almost always going to apply towards killing or defense context or threat assessment. Um, but in the civilian community, you can operate in a much more diplomatic context, uh, a more scientific, uh, exploratory, curiosity context. So if the UFO community wants to know more about what is going on with UFOs themselves, they need to pursue it through civilian avenues unless there's a war to going place. Now, if they want to know about what's going on in terms of it with the military, then they need to look at the places like the OI message. But if they want, if they want civilian stuff and they're looking for, you know, like the American version of it, it's, I guess it's going to be ASRO, but there's other institutions around the world that have been looking into it for a long time uh, between, uh, uh, I know Italy has one that's been going on for, what, 20-some-odd years now? Mexico's also the Senapro. Mexico's tied it in with their health and human services thing for monitoring with that. I think Chile even has a museum now. Was that you, actually, who posted the link to the museum science, Bob? Yes. Yes. I don't, it was some time ago, but yeah. That is a coolest looking thing. That is a that is a good reason to go visit that. Anyway, I'm sorry. I think I might have rambled on that answer there. That's all right. No, we ramble here. Go ahead, Bob. No, no, no. I'm good. You, you're, you're doing great. I'm sure there are other questions. Yeah, we got one coming up here from Jonathan Davies. How many years will it, we have to wait before acceptance of the topic in the mainstream will turn into a new religion? This worries me. Do you want he's, that he's, you asking, want that he's asking a quantity question, and I just don't have any really good way to assess it. So it depends on it depends on how the phenomena behaves. That's what I think. And so I don't know the answer because we haven't seen enough behavior. <laughs> I think the first official litmus test of if and when it will happen will be whenever the report gets released to the public. Uh, by October or September, whenever it is that it's supposed to be due. Uh, I have a feeling it'll probably be an 11th hour thing that comes out. And uh, if anything is going to cause people to completely freak out, it would be that. But honestly, so far, all the signs point to the only people who really seem concerned about how the public is going to react to this are the people whose job it is to figure out that the public is going to react badly to it. The public themselves seems to be pretty okay with it. Uh, I, NASA brought in 20 different religious authorities and conducted uh, uh, quite a thorough study to see, you know, what would the effect be of disclosure uh, upon the civilian population. And in general, they're like, eh. You know, it's if it turns out that God's, you know, an alien, he's an alien or she or whatever, you know, they just they're they're willing to roll with the times these days. The days of witch burnings and uh, things like that are hopefully largely coming to a close. Now, if the if the UAP or the if the phenomena suddenly rises up and we see, you know, Ragnarok happening and Fenris coming out and eating the moon or the Arcturian or whatever you want to call it coming down. Oh yeah. People are probably going to drop to their knees and worship aliens in a heartbeat. I mean, yeah. <laughs> they're aliens. What are you going to do? So, uh, so there's, yeah, there, there, there's a lot of people. There are a lot of people uh, that care about what the Vatican thinks and believe the Vatican has lots of inside knowledge. And there are a lot of people that are worried about the impact on religion. Well, the Roman Catholic church is the vast majority of Christians. 
and they're conducting conferences on should we save the UFO people when they land? I mean, the, the Vatican scientists from the observatory are participating in all these, these interactions and conferences. I just don't think this is going to be that big a deal. Go ahead, Dave. I disagree with both of you. Oh. I, complete, I completely do. And I'll tell you why. We don't know how it's going to affect the economics. We have zero clue on how it's going to affect the military industrial complex, uh, the religious side of things with four and a half billion people on this planet still praying to one of the 5,000 plus deities on here. Uh, you know, they have no idea about the intent. And they are all taught, the majority of them, of the mainstream religions, that anything coming from the sky is evil. It is demonic, and we got to be prepared for battle and survival against the the foreign entities of uh, Beelzebub, shall we say. All right? doesn't matter whether it's Islamic. It doesn't matter whether it's Christianity or anything like that. Plus, you have right now a very paranoid society that thinks the governments are all, around the world are coming to get your guns, that they're coming to take over, that they're coming to, to do all of this heinous action towards you. And, you know, I don't see it happening. I think there is way too much panic. There is way too much fear in people now, and people are going to do what they can to survive. Now, I don't talk a lot of COVID on this show, all right, but I will say this. With COVID, we have seen literally the worst of humanity that I have ever seen in my life. The worst. People stealing food and diapers and milk away from single moms and single dads and, and the elderly. And we have seen people shun their neighbors. We have seen people rat out their, their friends and their family. There are families in North America and around the world now that cannot even get together for a birthday dinner for grandma because of their their vitriol towards their stance on COVID. We have seen the worst of humanity. I'm not trying to paint a negative picture here, but I think if you throw aliens into the mix, unless you've had an experience and you are prepared for it, I don't think anybody in this world knows what the hell they're going to do if all of a sudden John and Bob and Diane and Phyllis Gray, alien, come down and say, we're here, we're not leaving, and by the way, come with us. We have something for you. They're not ready. Not ready whatsoever. I think that's a fair possibility. I mean, if you think about it, uh, one of the recurring uh, narratives uh, of the main five to try and explain the UAP phenomenon uh, is that of a recurring uh, devastating apocalyptic war. Uh, you can observe that in the Mahara, Mahara, Mahabharata uh, and uh, even uh, alluded to in uh, the Bhagavad Gita and uh, in uh, various uh, indigenous texts all over the in ancient texts all over of these things. So it's entirely possible that this could have happened over and over and over again in the past. And uh, so perhaps each time it happens, it's a test to see how we're going to react. And maybe this time we get it right. And maybe next time we don't. I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I am steadfast that people are are ready you guys might be ready because you look at all the scientific benefits that you're going to get you're looking i think you guys are looking at it from a completely different angle that i could never understand because i don't understand science i know on off buttons i know how to turn a key to turn a vehicle on i know how to use the button to move my seat to where it's comfortable I know how to put my mute button on this on this microphone every now and again. That's what I know. The majority of the planet is like me or less knowledgeable. And I'm not very knowledgeable when it comes to tech. Right? So I can see where you guys are geeked out about this. Completely can. Right? And I can respect it and admire that. But if you take someone, okay, that that is has never had an experience 
and you put a foreign entity in front of them, and it could be a ghost, it could be a Bigfoot, or it could be an alien themselves, they will panic. Internally, they will panic. And I learned this the hard way because when I had my experience where I saw the alien in the forest with Samantha Mowat, I thought I was one of those tough guys too. And when I had that experience with Samantha Mowat in the forest, I froze and I panicked internally. I got that paralysis that people have when they, when they don't understand something. And one of them aliens communicates with Samantha and says, we're worried about the man's health because they already knew that if I would have went down there and met them with Samantha, I'd have had a heart attack. Hmm. That's the reality. And that's why I'm steadfast against the majority of people saying they're ready when they're not. Well, if I might, if I might offer an alternate scenario, you mentioned in driving your car, for instance, you might not necessarily know all the, uh, the various uh, bits and bobs that make it work and the forces that make it so. And yet, when you drive the car, you can tell inwardly if something's wrong with the car because it's not vibrating at the normal rate. You might have an odd shimmy in it or something, or you might hear an odd sound. Or if it's running just right and you hit that perfect flow or that, 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 that certain thrill you get when going down a hill or something, you don't necessarily have to understand the mechanics behind it but you can understand the feeling of it and and to appreciate the sensations of it. I think that's kind of how the non-scientific community can bridge the gap. Well, you know what? It's going to be a debatable issue until it happens. We got two and a half minutes left, gentlemen. Aww. I know. It flow on by. It really did. Brandon, do us a favor. Tell everybody where they can find you, your information, and a little bit more about Nightwatch Institute. Sure. Um, well, let's see. I'll, I'll lead with the Patreon. Um, I just set up a brand new Patreon. I apologize if I did it wrong, but it's uh, patreon.com slash node three, N-O-D-E three. Um, if you want to go to the website, it's node three dot org. If you want to email me, it's nightwatchinstitute at gmail.com. Uh, and usually I hang out on the Twitters, uh, whenever I'm, uh, collaborating with people, uh, publicly. And if I'm collaborating with them privately, well, then you'll, you'll know how we get in touch. Uh, as far as, uh, I, did I miss anything there? I don't think so. Oh, great. I don't think so. Science Bob, always a pleasure yeah. to have you here. Tell it's everybody great. how they can and, reach and, you. And my, my, my last word is, you already know that if they come and offer me a ride, I'm going to take a ride. <sighs> oh, yeah. And the postcard. Yeah, you or, can't forget the postcard. Or a Sofon. You could send a Sofon if you ever have read the three-body problem. Oh, yeah. At this, point, it's, at this point, gentlemen, it's NFTs. We could make millions oh. off the NFTs of Science Bob getting his whiskers pulled by the aliens on the Triangle spaceship. That's all I'm saying. I'm totally sticking with that. NFTs, Science Bob, that's where we're making it. Don't worry about the satellite. Non-fungible tokens saying good night. <laughs> don't, yeah, don't worry about the, the satellites anymore, Science Bob. We got NFTs to create. <laughs> that we do. Brandon Safford, thank you so much for joining us on Spaced Out Radio. You were wonderful for Science Bob and Friends. And I just want to say you can come back on this show at any time. We really, really enjoyed your opinion tonight. I would love to. This was so much fun. Absolutely. And Science Bob, as always, my friend, much love. And uh, we'll talk again very, very soon. Science Bob and Friends happens the second week of every month here on Spaced Out Radio, where we get to the who, what, where, when, why, and sometimes I will sneak in a little woo for Science Bob and our guests. Coming up next, we head to the swamp 
Swamp Dweller is about to join us on Spaced Out Radio. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Great show, guys. Thank Great you. Great show. Thank you. That oh, was we did fun. Good. We did. Yeah, and two, two hours is pretty short. <clears throat> it, it flew by. Y'all are wonderful hosts. It didn't even feel like a show. It felt more like us just hanging out in a room shooting the breeze. Yeah, that's kind of that's well, kind of the that's the ambiance we want. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know what? Spread the love, spread the word around the SCU that we're a good show to hang out with. Yeah, will do. Will do. I appreciate it. It was very respectful. It was professional. It was fun and uh, insightful. Loved it. And if yeah, you do get that a, position, it's not, a, you. It's, not, it's not a place where you're going to get jumped because I, I just, that's not me and it's not Dave. Right, right. That's true. And if you get that, if you get that position at SEU, uh, let's talk. Okay. Yeah, I would love right. to. I'm, I'm hoping right. I do because I, I, I love being able to connect dots for people. Have a good one. All right. Science Bob, take care. Uh, Brandon will take care, and uh, we'll be right back here, guys. See you guys. All right, Brandon Safford, Science Bob. That was a good show, guys. Ended with a little passion, a little sprinkle of passion. I'll be right back, guys. I'm going to just quickly hit the loo. I'll be right back. <coughs> That was a great show. 
Great show. Hey, I want to say a big thank you to Science Bob and Brandon Safford for coming on into the show tonight. And a big thank you to Simon Wales, Steve, Excalibur, Full Sinead, Phil, Candy, Nicola, Bob, Linda, and Smithy for the amazing super chats tonight. And I really do appreciate the love. Really do appreciate the love. And of course, Lynn Wallington will be having her her big time women in ufology. Uh, six-hour marathon here on Spaced Out Radio, Saturday, February 6th, starting at, I believe, 3 p.m. Pacific, maybe 2 p.m. I'm not sure. We'll figure it out. Huge lineup. Huge lineup of awesomeness. So make sure you check that on out. <clears throat> and what else can I tell you? We are approximately uh, nine people away from 300 for Canada's Great Unknown, my new YouTube channel with my buddy Merle. Could you do me a favor? Let's get to 300. I need nine more. I'm putting the link in the chat room right now. I know most of you have already subscribed to it, but if you like really spooky stories that we're finding out and people are emailing us, it would be great to have you guys come on out, hit that subscribe button. It's moving real fast. Let's see if we can hit 300 by the end of the night, if you don't mind. Canada's Great Unknown, and I would appreciate it. <clears throat> don't forget Las Vegas. I got, I eat chili for dinner. So I'm all gassy right now in this area, soon to be the other area, but right now it's right here. Uh, thank you to all the veterans who tuned us on in. We really appreciate it. Vegas, April 22nd to 24th. Here we go. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Here we go with the third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. Wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth, hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Join us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Paboosh. Paboosh is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as a clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read Shirky Poo's Newswire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and now on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. Let's head over to the swamp where our main man, Swamp Dweller, comes on in, tells us a spooky story or two each and every night, and I know you love it. I love it too. So let's get right to it. Let's go to the swamp. Hi, Spaced Out Radio listeners. This is Swamp Dweller. It's time for your nightly dose of spookiness on the show. If you have an interesting encounter or a spooky story that you would like to share, be sure to submit them in at swampdweller.net. You can also find our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash swampdwellerreads. Now, let's chill out, relax, and together, let's enter the swamp. My mom worked quite a few jobs, and with every position she made friends. They always had their paranormal stories. Everything from seeing Bigfoot in the Zuni Mountains in New Mexico, to seeing a ghost while driving home in the dead of night. For this story, my mom worked for a hotel with a restaurant inside, where she had a position as a hostess. One day, a close friend came back to work after taking her vacation. Asking her how her trip was, to Utah, her friend told her that they had fun but encountered something terrifying while on the way back. She explained they were coming home, and they had left late to make their trip home through the night. They were on the border of Utah and New Mexico, at a place so called the Skimwalker Alley. This area was well known for having some of the most extreme encounters with these entities, allegedly anyway. They had been driving for quite some time. It was herself, her husband, and youngest son. 
Their son had fallen asleep for quite a few miles, and she wanted to stay up to keep her husband company while he drove. It was somewhere around 3 a.m. when they reached the border. She wasn't paying any attention to what was going on outside. While she and her husband were in the middle of their conversation, her husband said out loud, What the heck is that? Turning her attention to the corner of the road, they approached a giant hill when she noticed something moving quickly down the mountain. Again, saying out loud, What the hell is that? Her husband promptly decided to step on the gas and try to get ahead of whatever this thing was that was quickly coming down the mountain. As they approached the hill, they noticed it was a deer, but this was no ordinary deer. As they looked closer, they saw something that just was not right. It did not stand on all fours, but was running on two legs. As they quickly drove past it, it promptly began following them, jumping from one side of the road to the other. They then noticed that it was almost like a man, and what he had on appeared to be a deer head. Desperately trying to outrun this creature, it kept up with them for quite a few miles, until in the distance, they saw an oncoming car looking to the passenger side. They saw it run off into the trees. Freaking out, they tried to keep their cool. They did not want to wake up their son. They kept staring ahead. A few more miles down the road, they had driven past a herd of deer, thinking, what if this thing came out of the dark and tried something? But nothing ever did. A week after she told my mom of the encounter, they went to see the shaman, and he explained that it was a skimwalker they had come across. He explained that the skimwalker wasn't there for them, but wanted to scare somebody. It just so happened that they were there at the wrong time. Her friend, wanting to be sure, asked him again if they were safe. He said that after their encounter, if they had come across any deer, which she said yes, giving her the reassurance that if they had come across the deer, it meant that they were safe from the skimwalker. After this terrifying encounter, they made themselves promise that they would never drive through the night in Skimwalker Alley. This happened the other night, on December 9th. We live on two acres in north central New Mexico. I live in an unincorporated area, a lot of open fields, and it gets very dark at night. My five-year-old Pyrenees dog, a giant dog, must be taken out to play or do his business. He will escape from the yard if no one is with him. Back to the other night, I took him out just before bed. Even with the porch light on, I could hardly see off the porch. My dog went and did his business. I could hear some heavy breathing and some sort of snarling noises to my left. I was beginning to feel very uneasy at this point. I called for my dog. Even though he is a huge dog, he fears his own shadow. He comes running up to the porch, whining and wanting to go inside. He rushed in, I locked the door and turned off the porch light. I told my husband what I heard. He said it's probably just the neighbor's dog. We went to bed, and the dog sleeps with us in our room as well. My side of the bed is inches away from the window. As my husband falls asleep, I heard a tap on the window. I lay there for a few seconds, thinking, did I actually hear that? Then I hear my voice calling my dog and telling him to come on. My husband says, why are you calling the dog? He's right here. I noted that the voice was coming from outside. Then we hear it again. He is looking at me with big eyes. What the hell is that? I tell him to be quiet by shushing him. These taps begin to turn into more aggressive bangs and then my voice becomes more distorted. I have heard people talk about how it always sounds like someone they knew, but distorted. Never could I understand it until now. I mouthed the word skinwalker to my husband, and he goes pale. I text my daughter-in-law. She is Navajo and from a medicine man and woman family and is spending time out on the reservation with her mom currently. I text her and say I think a skinwalker is outside. I explain the situation. She calls and tells me to put the phone on speaker and put it up by the window. I could hear her and her mom do a Navajo prayer as I did this. As I listened to their words, the uneasy feelings went away. We did not hear anything else after that. Last night, when I took him out, nothing happened. It is getting that time of night again, though. So wish me luck. Oh.
Gotta love the Swamp Dweller who comes on in. Make sure you go check out his YouTube channel. Hit subscribe. Sun or make that Swamp Dweller Reads on YouTube. YouTube.com forward slash Swamp Dweller Reads. And we got to move on, though. Thank you, Mr. Swamp Dweller, for that amazing, amazing story. We'll have another one tomorrow night. But it is time once again for the fedora wearing John Hudson and the UFO Report. How you doing there, John Hudson, as we always love it when he comes on in. Talk about all the weird, strange, and wacky stuff that is going on in the world. And I'll tell you, this is a very, very good time to sit back, relax, and just chase the woo. John, what's happening, my friend? Well, things are, oh. are certainly getting very interesting. Um, the first thing I wanted to cover is um, the fact that, um, you know, there's this new video out of this uh, uh, very funny looking uh, cloud video. But what I don't want to focus on is purely the cloud video, although I do recommend people actually watch it because I do think it's curious. But the aspect of what I want to focus on is the misconception of what people actually see and what people think people actually see. Because I, for one, can tell you that when I first started researching this um, and I would get jealous over the fact that, you know, other people had seen something and I hadn't, um, in most cases, I would have still been disappointed if I'd seen what they'd seen. Because what I want to well, see I is I want to see this beautiful, shiny, high definition thing that, you know, I can see like details on. Right. And that's not what a lot of people see. In this case, it was a cloud. Now, it was a very odd cloud it was a cloud that if you sped it up you could actually see that the cloud itself had planes of existence it actually had um orientation to it um in a way and so now it could have been an art project um honestly that could be a very advanced form of active camouflage that the u.s military has done um it could be something else i i don't know but the point is is that usually when i'm looking up at the sky as a kid i was always looking for a UFO, right? But the truth of the matter is, is that many sightings are stars, right? Very, very bizarrely behaving stars, right? Or they start out as behaving stars, or they're orbs, or they're, uh, who's that one uh, woman that she gets like, like, God, man, they look like, 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 like luminescent jellyfish and things in the sky. I mean, people see some weird, weird wackadoodle stuff, right? But the point is, is that if you were looking into the sky and you actually want to see something that strikes your curiosity, don't always just look for the plain and simple movie version. Look for anything out of the ordinary because some of the videos have been coming out lately. If you didn't, if you weren't studying that film, if you weren't, because in some cases what you'll see is you'll see just three stars and the three stars start moving and they're moving in alignment. You don't see anything else. You just see three stars that seem to be, and you suddenly start realizing those three stars form a triangle, and you see nothing else. Now, once again, that could be a special effect, but the point is, is that that's not what I would have been looking for a couple of years ago, right? So all I'm saying is that the cloud video is a good thing to watch, but I think it's also a good opportunity to, for all of us to kind of talk about the fact that we're not talking about the sports model anymore, right? Uh, it, it, are there some of those? Uh, oh, please, I hope so, I really do. But let's face it, right? What most people see is is either you know completely different shaped objects, right? Or in some cases, they don't see a vehicle; they only see uh, one of the occupants. I saw that video because you sent it to me, mm -hmm. and watching this cloud morph into so many different shapes, mm -hmm. like you know what? There was no pixelation. It didn't look like it was some sort of CGI because mm -hmm. I'm always suspicious of those type of things. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying, John? Usually mm -hmm. the, you know, usually within the first 30 seconds, you can, you can look at this and say, well, this is BS. This is garbage. Most of us get an instinct for it. Yeah, absolutely. 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 And, and the other thing I look for is 
I look for things that are are either um, uh, either unique or they're unusual enough that I know only a smaller set of a subset of people know those details and to see if those details are included because those details can be very, very, very telling, right? Um, you know, the, a certain, there are certain aspects that become um, a very kind of, um, uh, I wouldn't say normal, but um, you get correlations, I should say. Very true. Very, very true. And, and, you know, I mean, I don't know about you. I mean, our eyes and our brain are, are trained to see things in, in clouds. We can recognize it. That's why we can look at clouds and, and say, okay, that one looks like a person. That one looks like a dinosaur. That one looks like a shark. Okay. Because our brain is trying to, to, go through its database and, and yeah. think what's this what does this it's look pattern like matching your pattern matching it's fast absolutely you can. absolutely yeah. you know but the thing that interests me about this cloud is at one point it looks like it actually morphs into a human head with a face and then it goes into like a rectangle and then it goes into a a number of different uh phases that it that it transforms into you know when you look at something like that i mean I am just dumbfounded by this see, one. See, if you the thing is, is that if you had if you had an object and you had that object completely covered in um in screens that are, that project, right? And and you have the software to account for the angle issues that you would run into with a rotating object. Having that vehicle project a hyper realistic cloud where the rest of the object is see-through i'm just wondering how hard it would be to recreate what we saw if i had an unlimited budget and a bunch of darpa people behind me you know what i'm saying i mean i'm just wondering like because I, I look i've i know i shouldn't say that i i have i have more knowledge than i should about how far along active camouflage is in the military right active camouflage is in play However, um, it, it, it has a lot of challenges um, with it. And, um, and it's not, to my knowledge, it's not to the level that that was, right? Because um, to me, I would be honestly just as excited to find out this was, dark, this was Lockheed as I would to find out it was, it, was, it was Alpha Centauri, right? I mean, it's like, to me, that was just super crazy cool technology, right? Um, and the thing is, is that to an earlier point, I find that when people replicate things, they typically replicate common things. Things that you things that you've seen before that you could compare them to and say that looks real. So when someone shows a video that is of something that is really really rare or unique, it I think it invalidates some of the claim of a fake because what are they faking? They're not trying to fake something that you've already seen before, right? So it's it's a different kind of it's a different kind of analysis. John, is there any way possible that this object? Sure, I love looking at it. <laughs> Whatever it is, do do you think that you know? For a lot of people who look at this, they'll say, "Look, that looks like a, a bunch of spread out cotton, and cotton is very, very light and can be blown in the wind, or maybe it's a plastic bag, you know, a large pe plastic bag, like like a bag that would go onto a mattress or something along those lines." Is this kind of what we're playing with here? Well, if you if you only saw this much of the video, then then you might be able to argue that. But but what you're looking at now is just this sh 20 second clip that I did that speeds up. The real video is like a minute and tw I think 15 seconds long, and you follow it all the way down, and eventually it goes behind some buildings, and and you can see it. I mean it. I mean, look it to me. It looks okay. Let me put it this way. To me, it looks like a material that has memory, okay? And what I mean by that is it's a material that has a sense of its form and tries to maintain that to a degree. And that indicates something. Now, look, there are, there are fluids that will do that, right? I mean, there are. There are, there are, there are uh, I assume there are gases too. But the, so, but the thing is, is that that thing is trying to keep itself contiguous. And when it turns, you can see it has a top and a bottom and it has sides and it shouldn't. It's a cloud, <laughs> right? So 
Well, the interesting point for me is the is the almost looking like translucent orbs that are inside of it. Yeah, well, that and that's the other thing that that, that I didn't I couldn't see as well from the video. But if you listen to the original video, what he's talking about is that's actually the part he is the most enthralled with. He's not the guy watch, filming it is not most enthralled with the cloud. What he's most enthralled with is these multicolored lights that he says are appearing inside the cloud. These pin pricks of light that keep turning off and turning on. That I that I saw a glint of that, but I didn't. I couldn't see that really well. I don't know. And what was know. interesting was was it um, was after I posted this because um, I mean the thing was is that you know I, I said when I posted this I did exactly what everyone shouldn't do. I took a video that I'd never seen before, that I'd done no research on, that I had no chain of authority on, that I had knew, knew, knew nearly nothing about, and just dumped it on the Twitter and said, here, right? And like, that's like the last thing you want to do. So please don't ever repeat what I just did. But the cool thing was, is everyone actually reacted quite well to it. And um, and a couple of people actually pointed out um, almost identical videos that were filmed by other people at, at other times over a two year period. Um, including um, Jason Turner that posted one um, that he took a year ago. Well, we should give thanks to at UAP TikTok. Yes, on yes, TikTok absolutely. For, at, for yes. this video. I apologize. Yes, 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 yes. I apologize. I just said in the very beginning. Thank you, Dave, for making that point. Yeah, not, not a problem. Yeah. And so if you just, if you go on, if you're wondering in, in Radio Land where you could see this video we're talking about, go on TikTok and then type in at UAP TikTok, and you'll be able to see the link in the video, which is about, oh, a minute and 25 seconds long. So far, it's had hundreds of thousands of views, 91,000 plus likes on it, and, you know, almost 4,000 comments on what this is. I think yeah. it's strange. You it know, is. it's super strange. I, and look, the thing is, it, if it is an art project, Holy shit! That sorry, that guy deserves all the press he's going to get, right? I mean, this is this would be an amazing piece of work if this was done by an artist, right? Um, but I mean, my, my guess is is there's something real to this, you know? I just don't know if it's going to be a government program or something else. I don't know. Is it some sort of weather modification? Well, we no, 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 no. Because my my uh, look, it's actually not hard to find data on weather modification and. You know, weather modification is is it's not an exact science, but there is a science to it. And and that's not that's not a that's not an outcome. Right. I mean, because um, the thing is, you have to ask yourself, why would you want to build that? Right. Like, what would what what purpose does it serve? It's not delivering DoorDash. Right. So what's it doing? We don't have that in can in uh, my oh, town. Sorry. sorry. Uh, food delivery to your house. Don't have that. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. No. So it's so it's not. Um, it's not. Um, uh, yeah. So it is truly strange. But I, but like I said, I also wanted to kind of use this as a really good conversation piece to get everyone talking about the fact that 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 what what a lot of people see today is not silver discs. It's it's anything out of the ordinary that doesn't look natural. And so when you're looking to the sky look for things that are look like they're off don't just look for hollywood very true john we've got about a minute to go here uh before we have to go to break here at the uh top of the hour here or bottom of the hour here on spaced out radio and i gotta tell you you know it wouldn't surprise me if this came out as some sort of video type hoax or trick it really wouldn't uh surprise me but i mean either cgi is getting that good where you can't tell maybe it's a natural phenomena but maybe it's not we have 40 seconds well i mean the thing is is that when you get down to it it's a hell of a fun thing to look at right and and let's face it one of the biggest problems we have in this industry is we we, we, we really suck at failing things out right and there are still videos I have from two, three years ago that I have an inkling have some realness to them, but I can't get anyone to, to, to make a determination on them. All right. When we come back with the fedora wearing John Hudson, university degrees on UFOs? Is this possible? Are universities going to start teaching 
UFO classes. Think of the fraternities. This is going to be great. We're going to continue on. I want my bachelor's, my master's, and my doctorate in woo. We're going to find out how you do that when we return on the Unbiased UFO Report with the fedora wearing John Hudson right after this. Hi, sweet Donnie D. Devin, then, we how you, then, then we could call you Dr. Wu, Dave. That'd be cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, Apollo believes it's CGI. Oh, I mean, look, it totally could be. I mean, it totally, it, it absolutely totally could be. Um, you know, the thing is, is that, um, um, yeah, I don't know. Just, you know, like I said, if, yeah. If, if it is CGI, I'd like to know, uh, like, what the goal was, right? Because, like, if, if I was going to make a fake UFO video, I wouldn't have done that because there's not much of that out there, right? It's like, that's a pretty odd thing, you know? So it's like, so, like, if you're trying to fake a, a fake a UFO, then... So maybe they were trying to just demonstrate some skill that they have, you know, for sure. And that may be it. Well, no, with with, with the right with with the right sort of um, with the right sort of equipment and and uh, absolutely no, I mean, look, I mean, let's face it. I mean, um, you know, anyone that says that you can't, um, you know, do something um, in special effects just needs to go watch a movie we can do anything with enough money we can do anything anything um you know uh will it look good from every angle eh, probably not but it depends the active camouflage is getting damn good mm -hmm. absolutely especially because now we have powered versions and non-powered versions love it love it Trying to, uh, Merle has a video on his TikTok that has been, where is it here? It's got a, this thing is just taken off. It has literally over 205,000 views. Merle's thing? Yeah. Wow. This is, this Go is Merle. a road. This is on a road in my old hometown where I grew up. I've driven this road, and it is considered an extremely haunted road. So we're going to play this for you here for Merle. Merle! Merle! So this road is haunted. Apparently has a lady in a white dress that walks. Now, this is on top of a mountain. On, uh, I believe, Sumas Mountain. Wow, and the road. Oh, just. I do. If I ever haunt any place, I'm gonna haunt place someplace cool. I mean, like. And there, fine. there's a ghost dog that runs, uh, on this road too. Now, see, that makes sense. All dogs love yeah. on roads. Yeah, it's a nice road too. Yeah, I know exactly where this is. It's kind of trippy when you know. Oh, geez, John, I, I give everybody a bad view there. No, 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 but they've, there's no, there's no center, there's no center line. No. Well, you got the crack. What do you need? What do you need a center line for when you got the crack? I see. Mm hmm. Huh. Yeah, okay. bodies there. Now that road used to lead up. See where it says teenagers like to come yeah. here and party. Yeah, yeah, Dave did that. Dave did that. Oh, Never yeah, heard yeah. this screaming, but apparent up on this mountain here, there used to actually be this mansion that people claimed was a satanic uh, cult's uh, ritual site. Oh, that's awesome! Did you go? No, scared me Aww. too much. Scared Aww. me too much. Yeah. So that's Merle, everyone. Merle. Wait, 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 why did that why did the why did that video get so many views 
No idea. Just took off. I'm so Just baffled. I, yeah. I assumed that he saw something on it. Like, no. That's no. Weird. Totally. Huh. Totally weird. Yeah. That's super odd. I was all excited. I was like, ooh, Merle caught something on video. Right. Hey, Zeta Connection with Paul Hamden and Cyan. How are you? Welcome. I'm all excited for Merle. Now I feel kind of like he cheated me. No, he didn't cheat you. Merle doesn't cheat anybody. <laughs> Got me all excited. I, I thought I was going to see like a, 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 a white lady ghost throwing tennis balls for a, a ghost dog or something cool, you know? Uh-huh. Hold on, guys. That's right, Lynn. Paranormal. Paranormal. Very nice. You get your paranormal t-shirts at our website, spacedoutradio.com. So make sure you go check out our swag there. Here we go. Round at third, we're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate it. Want to remind you that if you have missed most of this show or others, check out our free archives at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot, reading Shirky Poo's Newswire, checking out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and now on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. For the final time tonight, John Hudson is here with the Unbiased UFO Report, and we're going to get into a little story here that... You could soon go to university and get your bachelor's of woo in UFOs. John, welcome back. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I, uh, I, 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 w- I, I hesitated to include this because you know, like, what can you say about it? But to me, it was just one. It's funny. It, but two, it, it is actually a, um, a, a foreshadowing of sorts. Um, you know, it, it's rarely Harvard that does something first, right? Uh, someone has to do it first. And uh, and so what we were seeing here is um, is this university, um, and I believe um, the, unfortunately, the site that it takes you to is uh, is in, I believe, I believe that's German. Um, so uh, yes, it's a, and, and this is in Germany, um, but you are actually, for the first time in history, for the topic of, 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 Unidentified aerial phenomenon. This is not a UFO degree, Dave. This is a UAP degree. Uh, is it previously referred to as UFO? Uh, has been officially recognized as legitimate object of academic research at a high-profile Western university called the Interdisciplinary Research Center for Extraterrestrial Science, IFEX. Uh, it's going to be an institute uh, of the Facility of Mathematics and Computer Science at the JMU. And so this is actually, I mean, it, it, what's really cool is, is if you, if you read the article and as you'd hope, this isn't a joke. They're taking this really seriously. They're actually really taking a swing at this. And um, if you've ever developed curriculum before, this is a daunting task. It really is in a, in a, from many, many, many angles. From the, the, the wealth of content to the depth of content to the quality of content to the variation in content to the ordering. I mean, my God, I mean, I just can't even imagine developing curriculum for this. Um, but, you know, but they're taking it seriously. And uh, assuming that this goes well, and I, I don't know how you'd publish job statistics in the future, uh, 96% of your students have podcasts. Ta-da! Um, but, um, but, uh, um, you know, but I mean, it's a really, really good sign. And, and I, you know, I'm, I'm more than pleased that, that, you know, some university is doing it now. What the, what the big hope is, is that you'll actually get several students graduate because, you know, we did have, um, 
uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Jeffrey Mishlov uh, succeeded in graduating with a PhD in paranormal studies from Berkeley, but um, that was a one-off. Um, he basically snuck out with that, and uh, and 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 they've made him suffer for it ever since. <laughs> and I don't think they're going to do that again anytime soon. So this will hopefully be systematic, and um, that will be um, you know something that you know. I mean, you know, hell, I mean, if if five years from now you know, five people have graduated from that program. That'd be cool. Oh, I think it would be cool too. How are they going to get legitimate people to teach this course? Well, the thing is, is that, I mean, that's the funny part about this, Dave, is it, is it, you know, we, we so much brand this as this esoteric topic and, oh yes. I mean, there are definitely rabbit holes of that you can fall yourself, fall into. But the truth of the matter is, is that this topic dovetails into almost every other aspect of our lives. And so as a result of that, all you have to do is take someone who's an expert in that area of life and have them study and discuss what impact they think it's going to have on that part of society, right? And that's how you start. And, and that's how you start basically figuring out what, what challenges are there that you have to solve. Um, but the truth of the matter is, is that it's that part's not that hard because it touches on every, I mean, let's face it. I mean, depending on what stage you're at, right? But I mean, you know, let's take, for example, um, let, let's take, you know, many, many years in the future, right? And you might have the possibility of, of, um, of, of actual visitors, right? Of actual um, non, non-escorted visitors, right? Non-escorted visitors, right? Imagine the, the work that would have to go into training police forces changing laws to you know but all the things you'd have to do to make sure that that you know some police officer didn't just pull up and and shoot the poor creature because it, it did the wrong thing you know i mean there 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 could be a lot involved in these processes and and you know and so you, you there's quite a lot that you could study to to kind of figure out you know what are the what are the best ways to approach this stuff have they defined how they're going to break down the topics year 1 year 2 year 3 year 4 I, well, the thing is, is that for them to have announced it, I would argue yes. Um, um, and and they, they make a point that this, this, this is not, you know, this is not a, an undergraduate degree. You know, um, uh, this is, um, you know, this is advanced studies um, and, it, and it will be somewhat, um, um, you know, somewhat independent as, as far as the research is concerned. But, um, but it looks like... Um, it looks like they're getting uh, many different institutions, including the Max Planck, Max Planck Society, the German Aerospace Center, the Federal Aviation Office of Germany, the Weather Service, to be, to get involved and and uh, and provide assistance, provide um, you know resources, provide um, individuals, and so forth. I mean, the, it, I mean, I've never been to this part of Germany, but I mean, I have no reason to believe this is anything but an absolute stand-up effort. Especially, I mean, I don't know if you've ever spent any time in Germany, Dave, but my, what a beautiful country. And they, they, it, it, a lot of good engineers in that country and, and they build things well and it's nice. Um, fantastic airport. Um, so, you know, I, I have a lot of hopes for this. Right. Okay. Well, let's, let's see how this goes for success because I mean, Look, this entire field, you've heard me say it before, John. One of the biggest issues is it's very anarchic. The UFO world, the Bigfoot world, the paranormal world, very anarchic. And to be able to actually see a course actually start up on ufology, I'm hesitant because I don't think that they will capture the proper esoteric nature of the subject. But it is a step forward. And the thing is, Dave, is that, is that I could, and, and you probably could, and there's probably a lot of people that could. I mean, I, mean I, I wouldn't, I mean, don't get me wrong. You'd have to break things up into incredibly small chunks of information. I mean, my God, the syllabus would just be insane. But you could do it. You could do it. You could absolutely do it. But I agree with you. That that's part of the fear. That is a big part of the fear. Okay, finally tonight, you were talking about Chris Mellon. Is there a yeah. book 
his horizon well, too? No, no, it, no. That was sorry. That was my joke about his his uh, his his article in the debrief because um, um, it's 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 quite long and um, and people have been um, um, you know I, I wouldn't go quite as far as say complaining. Um, I will say commenting on on the length of the article um, and. Um, and uh, and then I, I had a couple of people, you know, express kind of uh, discontent about the fact that, you know, uh, you know, people weren't doing a kind of analysis of it. And so I thought it would be really helpful to, you know, maybe tonight and a couple of the nights that, you know, um, myself and you're welcome to do so as well. We pick out a couple of things um, from the article that we think are really, really pertinent to help people digest it better, just because it is a long piece of, of, of literature to read. And it but it's very, very useful and it's very helpful. And I I guess my point is, is that. I, I, I'm hoping by doing this, I will tease more of you into wanting to read it. What sticks out for you on the Chris Mellon article? Well, I mean, it it it's 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 a it's almost to be really honest with you, it's almost a more of a question of what didn't stick out to me because I I'm I I love this article so much. But the thing is, is it what 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 immediately jumped out to me and what I wanted to cover just briefly today um, in a little more detail or not in depth, but in breadth is the fact that, you know, in the, so he, he does this very beautiful layout of this, of this article. And he, he very much lays it out like a, um, um, oh God, you almost argue like a legal argument where he basically, you know, states all of his evidence up close up front. And so the first thing he goes into is is these radar capabilities, and I mentioned some of them before, but I just wanted to cover a touch of them. And to me, like the rest of the article is really, really good. And there's other parts that I could argue are more important. This section of the article um, is the part that I'm kind of the most surprised that he was allowed to write. Um, and um, but. The point of what that he gets to, I'll, I'll get to in a second. And that's really the, the the main point of what I'm what I'm getting at. It's not really the details, so I'm just going to cover them briefly. So we have the space fence, which I mentioned before. So the space fence is the one where it there's beams that go up from north and south, and we basically um, monitor uh, objects in in orbit. Okay. Then we have the solid state array, which is what I mentioned before. That's the one that looks horizontal, um, and it looks both directions. Uh, and uh, and so basically, the combination between the two is uh, in, in one case, it's a softball, and in one case, it's a golf ball, I think it is. But basically, those are like the size of objects we're able to monitor in incredible detail from an incredible range, right? Um, there's the uh, Global uh, Infrasound Acoustic Mo Monitoring Network. I've mentioned this before. Um, there are um, 60 stations in 35 countries, and um, this is all part of the test ban tree. And essentially, these are, are devices all over the world that measure pressure and sound and, um, and vibration and, and other things. And so this was really designed to detect underground nuclear detonations. But it's so hypersensitive that the likelihood that you would have any sort of extraterrestrial vehicle crash and you wouldn't pick it up on this, I don't know. I have a hard time believing that one myself. Um, there is the U.S. Space Surveillance Network, um, which is um, distinctly different from the uh, previous mentioned system. This includes um, sea-based X-band radar and so forth. There's the, um, the space-based uh, infrared system. There's the active electronically controlled scanned array uh, um, radar system. That's the stuff that um, uh, is um, uh, tied into the Navy's Aegis system. Uh, the FAA has their own system. And then he mentions several other systems that are kind of auxiliary. And so what he's what he's really getting at is is the the the, the, the gist of his article, which is that we shouldn't just be like it would be weird if the Air Force was just taking a low activity role in this whole thing. The fact that they're absent isn't just weird. It is absolutely shocking and deserves a direct answer completely independently on its own. Because if you look at these systems, most of which, if not all of which, are under the control of the Air Force and now the Space Force, this is an organization that, um, I mean, j just the infrared satellite network 
from from that from that network, we should have data every single time anyone entered or entered our atmosphere. And we should be able to correlate that someday. We should be able to correlate that if this is what's going on, we should be able to correlate that with abductions. We should be able to actually say, okay, look, this person had this, this incident in this house, in this region, and in that hemisphere, we saw an object enter in, in, a, in a time frame of you know an hour or six hours or whatever before that. We should be able to start correlating that kind of information. And we're nowhere near it. And that's irritating. Mr. John, another fantastic edition of the Unbiased UFO Report. Keep up the great work. We'll talk to you in a couple of nights' time. Yep, yep. And I thank you for your amazing efforts in bringing the news to our audience, my friend. John, John is kind of boring. It's not a nice thing to say. Matthew Kennedy, well, why would you say that? Well, you know, I mean, some people just, yeah. uh, it's because you, you're, you're very dark. You don't have enough light on. That's why. Oh, well, that makes me That's boring. Oh, I don't know well, that it's your chin hair. You don't look, you don't look like Barry Gibb anymore. But let's let's get to Shirky Boo's news, shall we? All right, let's see what Shirky Boo has up for us tonight. It's not exactly smooth sailing these days in the Dutch city of Rotterdam, where locals are voicing their objection to a plan that would temporarily dismantle a historic bridge to enable the safe passage of a record-breaking yacht reportedly owned by former Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos. In fact, some are already making plans, albeit in jest, for what they will do if the project comes to fruition. They will throw eggs at the yacht. Some 13,000 people are interested, and nearly 4,000 have said they will attend a Facebook event titled Throwing Eggs at Super Yacht Jeff Bezos, which has been shared more than 1,000 times in the week since its creation. Calling all Rotterdammers, take a box of rotten eggs with you and let's throw them en masse at Jeff's Super Yacht when it sails through the Hef in Rotterdam. Now, this was set up by organizer Pablo Storman, and he says that the protest started as a joke among friends and has quickly gotten way out of hand. The news of De Hef's potential disassembly, however brief, has clearly struck a chord with both locals and international observers. You know, the bridge was built in 1927 as a railway bridge with a midsection that could be lifted to allow ship traffic to pass underneath. It was replaced by a tunnel and decommissioned in 1994, but was saved from demolition by public protest and later declared a national monument. The ship's three masts are apparently too high for the bridge, which is roughly 130-foot clearance. The sailing yacht is question, in question, by the way, is commissioned uh, reportedly by billionaire Amazon founder uh, Jeff Bezos, of course. So let's move on here to another story. Humanity at its finest in Indonesia, a wild crocodile that had been wearing a used motorcycle tire as a necklace, well, it's finally been freed. Six years this croc had been wearing the rubber necklace, but it was finally freed by an Indonesian bird catcher in a tireless effort that wildlife conservation officials hailed as a milestone. The 14.8 foot crocodile a female saltwater croc, has become an icon to the people in Palu, the capital city of central Sulawesi. The beast was seen on the rivers, uh, city rivers with its tire around its neck, becoming increasingly tighter, running the risk of choking her. Conservation officials were racing to rescue the croc since residents spotted the reptile in 2016, generating sympathy among residents and worldwide. In 2020, Australian crocodile wrangler Matthew Wright an American wildlife biologist, Forrest Galante, tried and failed to free the reptile. In January, 35-year-old bird catcher and trader Tilly, who recently moved to the city, heard about the famous croc from his neighbors, determined to rescue the reptile after he saw her frequently sunbathing at a nearby estuary. 
I have experiences and skills in catching animals, not only birds, but farm animals that are released from the cage, Teeley said. And I believe that I can rescue the croc with my skills. And that he did, stringing ropes together of various sizes into a trap tied to a tree near the river and laid chickens, ducks, and birds as bait. After three weeks of waiting and several failed attempts, the croc finally fell into the trap on Monday night. With help of two friends, Teeley pulled the trapped crocodile ashore and sawed through the tire, which was 1.6 feet in diameter. A video circulated showing the rescue, and now Teeley is a natural hero. And the crocodile goes back into the river, very, very safe, and more importantly, healthy. We got time for one more. Sheriff's deputies in Georgia were surprised to learn last week that what was reported to be a woman's body found along a hiking trail was actually a life-size doll, complete with accessories. The doll, dubbed Selena, was seen in Hichiti National Forest, and it was reported by two authorities last Thursday, but responding deputies quickly realized it was just a case of littering and not homicide. The victim, now known as Selena, is a little under the weather, but she has been having a nice day and is expected to make a full recovery. The department uh, joked on their Facebook, you know, that could have been a heck of a lot worse. Heck of a lot worse. Let's go right to the thought of the day. Scientifically speaking, what would you like to learn about UFOs in today's thought of the day? Bobby is faster than light technologically possible. Caroline, who's driving them or in control? Vincent, nothing. UFOs are beyond science or what we consider consider measurable with science. Joshua, what powers them and how? Magnus, their method of propulsion. Michael, how to properly study aerial anomalies and associative phenomena in a credible fashion, which results in legitimate answers that are a benefit to our understanding. Tobe, do I have to wear a mask on board? Probably. Ted, FTL drive? Yeah, Jamie, are they piloted by bio-creatures? And if so, what are the logistics of their biological needs in travel, such as food, consul- consumption, waste, etc.? Sparkles, how is light created in the craft? Joe, how to destroy them quickly and easily with common household objects? We're going to end it right there. Thank you to everybody playing along in the thought of the day. Thank you to Shirky Poo for the news. John Hudson for the unbiased UFO report. We got to say thank you to Swamp Dweller and to Science Bob and Brandon Safford of Night Watch Institute for Science Bob and Friends tonight. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio. Rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, at work, in your cars, wherever you may be. Thank you to everyone in our chat rooms tonight. YouTube, Twitch, LGAP, Revolution Radio, Facebook, Spreaker, and on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Remember, this show is copyright by Space Now Radio and SOR Media Adventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us. Because together, my friends, we're watching. We own the night, Mr. Bumblefoot. We need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yeah, the Wu train has docked for the night. But soon, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we've got room for them, too. Good night. Sequest right now. He's like, take us home, Captain, you large and in charge, hippie looking motherfucking son of a bitch. Do it! That's right, Captain. 
Get her done. Get her freaking done. Mm hmm. Hey, John. Yes, sir. I have to edit now because of you. Yeah, sorry about that, buddy. But it's my 11 20, 11 26 p.m. You made a shit. Yeah, Your first ever shit on this show. Yeah, I apologize. <laughs> but you know, I, figure, I figure, you know, I, I, I think this is show like 80 or something. And that's my first mistake. So I, I think I probably should get some kind of award I, for that. I'll give you an award. Your first shit on the radio. Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. Made, made it, made it, made it uh, 80, 80 attempts. And, and, uh, uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. That's pretty good, actually. Uh huh. Yeah. It shows Thanks, that I'm guys. Getting comfortable, and that, it shows that I'm feeling comfortable around you, Dave. Now, Dave, and I like you. <laughs> it's all good. Yeah, it's all good. We're downloading right now. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Do 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 do. I know you're out there somewhere watching me, you son of a bitch. Yep. Oh, hey, Dave. Can, mm -hmm. can, can, since after show, can, can I can I give a plug for that for that video that interview I sent you, the witness? Wit yeah, go ahead. Right. So everyone, like, if if you if you have some time and you, you want to listen to something, uh, witness citizen just did this interview with uh, Jay King, uh, who you guys have seen on the, on this, our show before, and and, and as well as Lynn's had him on before. He's a really good guy, and uh, and so so they sometimes host a show together, and um, and they had on this guy today, and now that I, I I'm saying this, I, I forgot his name. It's Robert. Um, oh, what was his last name? Anyway, this interview is not long. It's like it's just it's just a a, a, a smidge over an hour, and uh, his name's Robert Knight. And oh my, this interview, first off, super cool guy. Second, this guy, uh, he's like, well, honestly, he's like me. Uh, so he just, he bumbles into the most amazing situations. And, but he's a photographer. And so he gets invited to some of them. And so he's been basically photographing rock stars for like the last like 30 something, 40 something years. I mean, like one of his first gigs, he, he got to know Zeppelin and this guy knows everybody. He's friends with Hal Putoff. He's friends with, with, um, with uh, uh, John Alexander. He's friends with, I mean, the, like the, the, this guy was just, I mean, it, and he's like this musician, uh, he's not a musician. He's a photographer that falls around musicians and um but just it was like this incredibly fun interview it was it was i get a lot of uh, just amazing stories about musicians and so forth and uh and you know and all you know wrapped around their their uh, each of their own interests in the paranormal and their own interests in in, in the ufo phenomenon and um it, it it was it was actually it was really interesting it was it was a really it was a very, 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 and he, he made a lot of very bold claims too. He actually claimed that um, when when Tom DeLonge's first group got shish kebobbed, that the 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 second team, the Howl and and those team, that that team was instigated through introductions by him. Mm. He actually claimed that he'd been talking to Tom DeLong about this topic since 2011. And that, that he was the one that actually introduced him to Hal and, and, and all those guys, uh, basically saying that these are the guys you really want to be working with. And, and he claimed that he actually has all the email to back up that statement and that he gave a copy of those emails to the, to the show hosts. So, I mean, you know, it's pretty bold, but like, you know, it's certainly a, 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 another interesting data point if you're kind of creating a, um, um, uh, you know, like, a, you know, like what went, what went wrong with TTSA, you know, playbook. Well, I have my understanding of that game. 
and he and he was he uh the night stevie ray died mm -hmm. he was going to be on that helicopter really and oh, the next creepy. morning he heard on the radio that clapton had died and so he freaked out and called the studio to find out what the hell happened and they go no no it wasn't clapton he wasn't it was Clapton's. It was Clapton's helicopter, and he goes, "No, it wasn't Clapton. It was Stevie. It was Stevie Ray," and that's how he found out. And um, and uh, a bunch of the guys had stories about um, different um, musicians showing up to them uh, um, uh, on their death. Um, it was it, it was a, it was like I hope they, I hope they come back. I hope he comes back. I hope he, they said they said he was going to try to bring him back. But it's uh, it was just, give me the name of that guy and get that to a yeah Satter Robert Fish. yeah well, I'll, I'll send it off his name's Robert Robert Knight he's let's a rock and, and roll a legend photographer let's just try and get it to our team and let them yeah. do it yeah 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 totally yeah, yeah. Great he, he's, well yeah cause, well, I mean look it, for on any show this guy would be fun to interview but for you in particular Dave I think you and him will just it'll be cool. I think it would be a really, oh, to, you yeah. know, because I mean, ju just with like, just for me, just growing up with a bunch of musicians and, you know, doing the kind of roadie thing a little bit when I was younger and then just being really into bands and so forth. Like, like there was a lot about that interview that, that I think I found a little funnier than, than I would have otherwise, you know, just cause you know, yeah. it was a little bit, a little bit of inside baseball, you know, in a way, you know? And, um, and, uh, and so like, oh man, like you, you, you two will, you'll love it. You love it. Yeah. Fun Get to uh, Phil's or Cat to track yeah, him down. Yeah, yeah. I will. I will. I will. I, yeah, I'm not quite sure how, um, you know. But the thing is, that the, what what I'm kind of expecting to have happen is I'm, I'm, and it hasn't happened yet, but I'm expecting more people like this dude to start popping up. People that, that um, no, Robert Knight didn't shoot the cloud video. <laughs> um no he was on he was on he was on this interview with um with witness citizen and jay king um um that's funny um the navy research labs and so forth sorry. sorry just trying to find the ending here no right great right, we'll be All right. yeah, for what it's worth, all you did was add a T. Sorry about that. No worries. Sometimes I need to do that. Yeah, no, there were several people on that chopper. Um, I think there was four people, if I believe. Four yeah. or five people. They got caught up in fog, and the, and the uh, helicopter pilot, I believe, didn't didn't pull up. In, instead of pulling up and out, he went over to the side note lost power or something like that oh interesting interesting stevie ray vaughn was incredible yeah no i mean i I've, I've told you the story before of how i got to see him six months before he died and it was still one of the greatest concert experiences i've ever had in my life it was just an absolutely epic evening i bet like I said before, Carlos Santana showed up at the end. So like the last like two, three songs were like with Stevie Ray and Carlos Santana playing together, you know, out in the open stage at, at Shoreland Amphitheater on a hot summer night, you know, just uh, just absolute heaven. Awesome. But Carlos, San Carlos Santana is local. So he, he, he actually did that a lot. <laughs> He would he when when anyone ever, when anyone played Shoreline that he was friends with he would just he would often just show up at the end of the show and just hop on stage and play two. They just happened to be dropping by and oh, brought my guitar. Serious? No, seriously, it's like he did it all the time. It was funny. Yeah, Santana's great too. Yeah, boy, man, such a character. And you know the other thing you talk. You ever what? hear the story of his former uh, drummer who who was found on the streets near Santana's home, living on the streets the last fifteen years because he had a drug problem? 
at Centania. It brought him back to the studio, cleaned him up, and and uh, they they jammed out together again. No, yeah. you can go on YouTube and and, and oh, YouTube. Oh wow, it. wow, that's crazy, man. It's pretty cool. Hey, yeah, Johnny Music, how you doing, buddy? Thurston Howell the third. Yeah, Steve, Stevie Ray was something. Stevie Ray was something else. He really was. Um, but I mean, we've been lucky last last couple of years. We've been getting some. We've been getting some good. You could see good two guitars. artists, two artists that have left us in concert. Who would you see? Just two. Oh boy. Um. Oh boy. That's hard, man. Um, Mine would be Jimi Hendrix and Freddie Mercury. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Freddie Mercury would be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, you know, I mean, as, it, the, those would be awesome too. You know, I, I think uh, as corny as it may sound to a lot of people, I think for me, I, you know, I, I would have, I would have, I would have loved to have been to a, a, a proper Beatles concert. Yeah, I, I really would have. I really would have. Um, I would have. I would have loved to have seen Prince too. Yes. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Um, and the original Leonard Skinnerd. Oh, oh, yes, yes. That album, that that their their debut man, that God, that debut album is so insane. Like that, I got to admit. I got to admit, too, I would even love to see Elvis live. If it was if it was younger Elvis, yeah, 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 for sure. You just want to throw your panties on board with all the ladies. Oh, damn straight, man. Damn straight. Damn straight. What I love is you would not believe how often in, like, Warner Brothers cartoons, Elvis turns out to be an alien. Hey, Super Knower, how are you? Hold on. Oh, the doors. Seeing Jim Morrison live would be just freaking. Problem is, is that so many have gone, you know? I know, but for me, my number one would be Freddie Mercury with Queen. Yeah, I, uh, I have to admit, I, I think I gotta, I think I gotta give it to you there because, um, because you know, when you when you look at the kind of extreme unique nature of each one of those musicians and what they could do, the one of yeah. them of all of them that I would want to experience in person, like directly, would be his voice. Oh yeah. I mean, could just, you imagine being at Wembley Stadium in '86, his last final great concert, oh, and man. and all of a sudden, you know, you hear hear him belt out Radio Gaga, that would be, oh, it gives me goosebumps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, it's it's, uh, yeah, that would be. That would be really astounding. That would be really, really, really astounding. I mean, someday, um, in the not too distant future, we'll be able to recreate a lot of those concerts in VR, um, and you'll get a, you'll get a little taste of it. You get a teeny taste of it, um, but 
you know, the, the, the thing that a lot of people don't, don't realize too, is that a, a lot of the value of concerts too, is, is the people that were there with you too, you know, certain bands have certain types of people that follow them and certain types of, you know, cultures yeah. that follow them and so forth. And I mean, I would have loved to have seen Van Halen because I never saw Van Halen with, uh, with Eddie there. Oh. I'd love to have seen I'd love to have seen ACDC with Bon Scott. Mm -hmm. You know, another Black guy I would love to have seen. Who? Black Sabbath. Yeah. Another guy I would love to have seen is um, Joe Cocker. Oh. Oh. Wow. That would have been good. That would have been really good. Hold on, I forgot to edit your piece out. <laughs> Hold on, I gotta go to the twenty-six minute mark here. All right, so should be right around here. AP TikTok, you know it is. It's I, super strange. And look, the thing is, it if it is an art project, holy shit, that strange. And look, the thing is, it. If it is an art project, holy shit! That sorry, that guy deserves all strange, I, super strange. Holy shit! That oh, John, look at you swearing there. The old holy shit balls, eh? So R five, we'll save that. Overwrite it. There we go. One more to go. And where did we find that? Okay, right we're gonna about? have to we're gonna have to ban Fap. It's too bad. I'll miss him. Wenches, please remove him permanently. Is an art project? Sorry, oh, that guy deserves all the press he's gonna get, right? I mean, all right. That. He actually said the only thing worse than Queen is Van Halen. Gone. Well. You're Gone. talking about a guy who goes looking for dates at the bingo hall, man. Can't be too hard on him. Can't go banning him for that. Bingo hall work is tough. Fap runs a shirt that says, Bingo in ain't easy. I'll never forget the first time someone told me, but in all seriousness, that they had a, they had a, a gambling addiction and they had a problem with bingo. And I really liked this person a lot, and um, we were like becoming friends. And, and um, you know, I'm I, I like to think that I'm, I've historically been one of these friends that you you can talk to, and I'm you know I'm pretty open minded. I tend not to be very judgmental and so forth. So, but my God, I had so much trouble not just busting up laughing over that, man. I was just like, how do you get addicted to bingo? And he's like, he turns out he'd run like, you know, five, six games at a time. <laughs> oh, yeah. Some of them silver hairs at the bingo hall, they're dangerous. They're ready to kill you when they hear something. Some young person uh, all of a sudden talk about <clears throat> or yelling bingo. They don't like that. They don't like that. They are ready to stab their dabber into you, man. And Magnus, how are you? <sighs> Jason, good to see you, bud. I would have also liked to have seen Vinnie Paul in Hell Yeah, because that's going to kill that band now that he's not around. He mm. was the glue behind that band. And I really wanted to see Hell Yeah. <coughs> yeah, I saw Pantera. Their heyday. 
I think I did too. I think I did. I got to look. I actually, for a while, I kept all my concert tickets. I had a lot of them. We used to go. I mean, we used to go all because I mean, the only we started. I've we started kept is Guns and Roses. Say again. The only tickets I've ever kept is Guns and Roses. Ah. Uh, well, like I said, I mean, like the group of friends I was in, like you know, they they were all musicians, so it's like you know, and and so were like their a lot of their siblings. So like you know, my my buddy Chris, his his older brother, as soon as he got a driver's license. You know, we were we were driving to Oakland and to San Francisco to go to concerts, and he would he would take us with him. And so, you know, it was often like you know me and Chris and and you know and his brother and a friend. And so, you know, I'd be like you know, you know, fifteen years old, you know, up at the Stone in San Francisco, thrashing the DRI, you know, blissfully happy, you know, just like you know, just in just in the dream world. And uh, had no idea how lucky I was. Actually, that's not true. I had, I had, a, I had a glint. I had, a, I had an inkling of how lucky I was, but I, I didn't really grasp it. Especially when, like, when, like, there's places like to me, like, there's something just extra special about when you, when you go to a venue frequently enough that that you start to get to know the venue and the venue gets to know you a little bit like you get to know a couple of the people there you get again a feel for the place it starts to feel kind of like you're like a home a home base for you you know and then some like you know really great artist comes and plays oh man just nothing like it <coughs> excuse me Especially when you get all those, like, I remember, like, I one time there, um, there used to be this uh, little tiny club. They tried to open up more in the in the South Bay. I forgot what it was called, and uh, and they tried for a while to have bands play. And at one point, um, uh, the um, female uh, Dido um, played there, and it, it was when Dido had um, just come out with her first album. And up until that point, she'd been primarily only playing, uh, uh, like doing stuff on like Faithless's albums with her brother, and uh, and so, like the the album had started to hit in the U.S. It hadn't hit in the U.K. yet, so like like she had no popularity yet in the U.K. and it was just growing in the U.S. And so she get she got booked at this little tiny hole in the wall place, and so I went with a friend, and there was hardly anyone there, and so you know literally like they're you know they're up on like a, a three foot stage you know four feet in front of you and it's just like you know totally open and at the end of the at the end of the gig um she didn't she she took off but the band you know came off stage and hung out with us and drank and danced and and you know had we had a great time and and it was just you know it's really cool you know just like really nice and mellow Oh, Dido's voice just oh man, her voice is un. Eminem made her. Eminem made her. You what you think that? Why do you say that? Because of his song Stan. I'm not saying she isn't talented. She's got a beautiful voice. I I, I didn't get the feeling that she got I, you know, I, maybe she, I, I I never got the sense she got much much uh attention for that song but, but, but I, guess, I guess maybe she did that's how i found her oh okay. so i became a fan was well, i was a fan of her when she was with faithless um because I, I i i i've been a i've been a huge faithless um fan for a very very long time and um i actually have some of their stuff on vinyl um and uh and that's how and so when she first broke out to her own like um, both my wife and I were really excited and, and uh, you know, really, really enjoyed some of her stuff in the beginning. I haven't, I haven't checked in on her in a long time. Tori Amos just came out with a new album. It's like, whoa. That is quite, she is quite a musician. Very complex albums. Let's 
Let's see something here. Okay. <clears throat> oh, yeah, you get three Pepsis in me. I seem like a canary. You love your Pepsi. Don't blame you. Pepsi's fantastic. Oh, that's awesome, John. Yeah, no, God is a DJ is a just a freaking that track is just oof. Ugh. Cool. All right, I'm at that. All right. I'm at 299, 299 subscribers for Canada's Great Unknown. Somebody's got to give me one, one measly little subscriber. You're all, right you there. almost hit 300 already. Nice. Yeah, going, we're dude. one away. That's awesome. One away from 300. One away. That's really cool, man. That's super cool. Hey, did you so if YouTube like sent you like a little like like a certificate or something for crossing fifteen thousand? I got a little like online trophy. <laughs> That's awesome. I haven't seen Pepsi free in a long time. I'm sure it exists somewhere. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. Really? The, oh, that. You should try. That. May, uh, I don't know what you're doing with that collection, but I hope you're backing it up. Guy was just talking about the fact that he's got like like an incredible large collection of a lot of like rare and remixed sort of one off tracks from the from the 90s. And so, I mean, like some of my like I so often find that the, some that my favorite version of of a song that anyone does is some strange one-off twisted version of it that they only did once and like and that ends up being my favorite one like what is it like paul oakenfold does this like this is one like Latin extension version of one of their songs that just brings in this whole different sound to it. And, oh, it's so cool. I'm at 299. Need one. One measly subscriber before I go to bed tonight. There's the link <coughs> in the chat room. There's 74 people listening. I'm sure one of you hasn't hit subscribe yet. Canada's great unknown. Come on. First person to sign up gets to kiss Dave in Vegas. How about that? <laughs> oh, you know who else I would want to see in concert? Hmm. Frank Sinatra. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You know, I got to say, though, you know, I try really hard not to do this to myself and, and I'm going to learn better, but I need to stop looking into the past, into the lifetimes of some of these people because, boy, man, like Frank Sinatra was not a good person and I did not need to find that out. That really bummed me out. The one that bummed me out was Bing Crosby. Oh, yes. That was he okay. even worse. Oh, he, he used to be worse. He used yeah, to beat could, the car out of his children, and I know I couldn't believe his that. Wives, yeah, I'm like Bing. What's going on? You can't be that guy with the name Bing. I know. You know, I you, know. like your parents named you Bingo. <laughs> like you can't, you can't do that. Yeah, it's not nice. Yep. yep, yep. Here you are beating the feathers out of your children. It's terrible. Old blue eyes. Mike. Duck. <sighs> Frank had pull, though, man. Mm-hmm. 
Frank had pull. That's that one thing I loved about it's some of these, some of those um, comedies that were coming out in the eighties and so forth. Is every once in a while you get these cameos of of these older stars that you wouldn't, that weren't, you know, especially if you were like as a kid, like you know, like for example, um, um, uh, what's his name? Um, Sam, uh, uh, um, Sammy, um, Sammy, Davis um, Sammy Davis Jr. I, I think the first time I saw him, like, was in like probably like Cannonball Run or something like that, right? Like, like you know, not his like you know you know premier you know uh, like you know you know uh, movie of his career or so forth, but. Like, you know, that's how I got introduced. And, you know, then I went and, you know, dug into him more and, you know, enjoyed it. But, you know, but it was just kind of funny. Oh, dude, I, um, he was fantastic. <coughs> all of those crooners were, all of them. Seriously. Absolutely fantastic. We're at 300. We made it oh, wow. to 300. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Apollo, I, I know some very nice Satanists. Just because one's a Satanist doesn't mean they're not a good person. You know another one of my YouTube fetishes is in watching videos? There's oh, a bunch of Chinese fishermen who have channels, and what they do is they, they take these giant wa uh, water pumps to these like rock islands oh, no. and then they drain the water pumps. Uh, they drain the water, the water with these giant water pumps. And then they collect the fish for the, for sale on the wet market right isn't after. That, isn't that cheating? No, dude, I'll show you here. Hold on. This, this guy's pretty cool here. Hold on. Let me, uh, that's not fishing. That's slurping. Well, like, watch this one here. Hold on. Let me just get to it here. I might get in trouble because his channel's monetized, but that's okay. So here he is. Here's this guy. He's going to throw a dead goat into uh, into the water here. A dead All goat? Right. Yeah. Okay. So, so you got the big ocean back here. Right. I better, I better small in it. That's, right? They throw the goat into the pond. Okay. Right, they wait a few, they wait a few days, then they wait for the tide to go down. And I'm just going to skip through here, and then they they drain they drain the uh, the what's it called the the water out of there, and because they have baited it, they get all this these these really cool fish. Like, look at the size of that eel. Whoa! They're going to eat that. They're going to eat that. Well, it looks like that eel's going to eat him. Yeah. I mean, that thing's that, at least... That thing was it, mad. It, yeah, of course it is. Oh of my. course it is. And I assume it will bite you? Oh, yeah. It, they're like water snakes. Oh, my God. Right? Yeah. So then you, you look at the octopus. They get everything. Just throw Aww. it in the bucket. No, don't take Just the octopus. That octopus is probably smarter than he is. Probably, but oh yeah, there's another eel. What the hell? Just throw that sucker into the bucket, right there. That's right. Yeah, them, yeah. But not the not the not the octopus. You know they're 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 wicked smart creatures. Oh yeah, throw the fish in there. Oh yeah. Huh. Look at, look at the size of that one there. Yeah, I think that's cheating. I don't it's know. It's not cheating. Better than fishing with nets. In the That's true. In the of the uh, that is true. That is true. I agree with you. I agree with you. Right? Oh, he's I got totally some monsters in here. Oh, yeah. Probably should kick this along here. Look at the size of that one. But yeah, man. And then what they do is they... Uh, oh, look at that little shark there. Big dog shark there. They'll eat that. That's that's good eats right there. Fap would love to chow down on that. Oh, 
they're all in the bucket. No, it's happening. It's not oh, yeah. a myth. They've come to take us. We're being abducted. Oh, yeah. There's... Oh, I wonder if there's a huge fish myth about abduction. Could be. Look at that. Another eel. Imagine the stories they tell about like these large things that come with lights and they drop these nets down and they abduct thousands of us at the same time. Oh, man. Can you imagine? I bet you there's a whole mythology around like abductions from a fish perspective. Oh, yeah. Like, you're just hauling in the fish here. I watch this guy almost every day just to see what he catches. I like how the fact that he's the only guy, too, who puts the English uh, subtitles on so I can actually see oh, what he's doing. Nice. That's look nice. at that lovely octopus there. Oh, wow, look at that. Yeah. Then at the end here, hop over to the end. It's gross, some of the shit they eat over there, though, man. Uh-oh. Tide's starting to come in. So what, is he going to get out of there, or they're going to turn, they're gonna, they're oh, gonna turn on him? Oh. He gets all these little fish. So this is this is basically like like you know like going after tide pools, essentially. This yeah. Is a, an industrial an industrial sized tide pool that uses. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. So then, get to the end here. He's got to climb out of there somehow. Hey, has anyone tried to remote view a megalodon? That would be kind of cool. Yeah. Let's see what's happening in Namibia. Over to Namibia. Nothing. Nothing. Oh, they just uh, reflooded the water basin here. They did that. That's new. <coughs> to me, one of the most beautiful like like visions of the future I've ever read was in um, Robert Monroe's books and. And he basically describes a, a future version of Earth where, um, where we've we've learned to decouple our consciousness from our our containers, and so we can very easily hop from a body into an eagle, or into a jaguar, or into a a, um, a deer, whatever, and essentially ride along with that animal and experience what that animal experiences and see from that animal's eyes and feel what that animal feels and, and essentially use that as a form of, of learning. Um, oh man, it was so cool. I think a little grouse just flew in there. I'd eat that. <laughs> I would. I, I don't Gross. doubt it, Dave, but I just, I don't, like, when I see an animal show up in front of me, pretty much anywhere, I'd eat that. It's just very rarely the first thing that pops into my head. They're saying I would, I want to know where the oryx are. They're usually here in the morning. Where are the oryx? Zoom on in. Where are you? <sighs> anywhere. I don't see him anywhere. It's ten thirty eight. Something needs a drink. I have a raging headache that I need to go uh, have a conversation with. So I am going Nobody. to rent Ev and uh, and take care of that. And uh, I gotta admit, I'm really like I really I I'm, I I want to like go find more of those now. Like you got me curious. Like I'm super, like I love the idea of these these like like watering holes with cams on them all over like nature. Oh, dude, dude, there's a couple of them. They're cool. really good. Total time suck. But anyway, thank you, everyone. Much appreciated. You have a good evening, my friend.
All right, you too, sweet Johnny Pie. He's mm. my Johnny Pie. Oh, man. Anyways. I'm going to go to, I got to get up with my boy in the morning for school. I want to say a big thank you to Thomas, Apollo, Simon, Steve, Excalibur, Full, Sinead, Phil, Candy, Smithy, Linda, Bob, and Nicola for the amazing super chats. Really does help us what we do on each and every night here on Spaced Out Radio. So thank you so much. Tomorrow night on the show, <clears throat> you may have seen him in our chat room, Grant Baker. He's from Redding, California. He's an experiencer, big time. And we're going to learn his story. It's an experiential night here on Spaced Out Radio tomorrow night. So I love those nights. And uh, we're going to make sure that we um, we get them all in. And you know what? Your stories are important here, people. You really are. So uh, we will see you all tomorrow night. Big thank you to all the veterans. Tuned us in, all the regulars. Don't forget, uh, Saturday, February 26th, Lynn Wallington will have the Women in Ufology panel. Six hours of Women in UFOs. It's going to be extremely knowledgeable. Cheryl Costa will be there. Melinda Leslie, Alex Dietrich, Lorian Fenton, Samantha Mowat, Sinead Wellahan, and many, many others will be there. So make sure... You check that on out. And of course, Canada's great unknown. We hit 300 subscribers. So thank you so much. Pretty happy with that after just nine days of putting it together. So really appreciate that. We'll have more stories coming up here uh, in the next few days. And of course, with, um, <coughs> excuse me, conferences next month. 25th to 27th, both Lynn Waldington and myself will be at UFO Con 2022. So make sure you check that out. And April 22nd to 24th, the Vegas party for the fans. If you're one of the first 50 to sign up, email us at info at spacedoutradio.com. We are going to get you a swag bag. So make sure you check that on out. Come hang out at the Golden Nugget with us. We're going to have a live show there as well. So make sure you check it on out. Otherwise, we're going to take it away here. Let's warm up the trumpets. Say goodnight.